<laughs> very good. I'm very happy to be with you. Guys. Good to see you. So <laughs> now, uh, what we will do uh, is, uh, um, oh, there he is. John, John's following the good example of uh, citizenry here. <laughs> Uh, okay, but uh, what we will do, I will I will run through a bunch of slides, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we won't take uh, too long here. Uh, uh, Ken, I need a little bit of help um, getting to share screen. Let me see if we can do this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> A question, is this being recorded? Uh, good question to Ken. Yes, uh, that's the form you signed. Yes, we are recording this session and it will okay, be posted you, afterwards. Yeah, if you've not sent in your release form, please do because uh, you know it'll help us to get on air uh, quickly uh, after for archiving. So please do that. Now, let me go here and uh, see again. Mm. And are you able to see anything from my end here? Uh, not yet. Okay, one minute. How does that look? Yes. Okay, gentlemen, so uh, my, uh, so I do two things. I teach uh, in the School of Engineering um, and uh, in the Department of uh, Astronautical Engineering and uh, in the USC School of Architecture. My degrees are in both subjects, so I really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, welcome all. Uh, and uh, let me run through a few slides. I won't talk to all, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, eager to get into uh, all the good things that uh, our, our esteemed uh, um, group of people here have to tell us today. And I see that we have a lot of people who will be asking questions. So with, with all of that, it should be a very interesting, uh, interesting event, I hope. Good. So now uh, USC has a program that's been growing uh, through the years. And uh, we used to be uh, part of the um, uh, the aeronautical and mechanical engineering uh, group, which became the astronautical, uh, the aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering group. Uh, we got shuttled around. Finally, we decided we had it. We're going to have our own department and we call it the astronautical engineering department, which means anything happening outside of planet Earth. So uh, I'm sure we'll have other, other faculty talking to you in different times. I think Ken has had several of those talk. Um, are the slides moving, Ken? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Uh, so our, pro our um, uh, um, studio has been all about, um, it's a three unit class. It's a three unit class. So we don't expect students to do uh, too many things during the course of 15 or 8, 16 weeks. Uh, many of you have sat in reviews, so you know how that goes. Um, so it's focused on a very specific arena of, of, of um, architecture, and that is a conception. Thinking about new things. You don't have to be right. Uh, you don't have to be wrong. <laughs> you don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, express... Uh, any of your um, analytical skills, but you just need to have an idea in the classroom. And uh, we use uh, some of the techniques used in the School of Architecture in form finding and so on uh, to make this happen in the, in the classroom. Now, I'll tell you this, the way I proceed in the classroom is to tell them that, you know, everything that we think about has a deep philosophy behind it, if you have the time and the patience to think about it. 
philosophies are followed by visions that people create for themselves. And then in the governance model, we use policies and the policy of nations to, to work around how to do the next thing. And then it falls upon the professionals like architects and engineers to develop the concepts, architectures and engineering. It's a feedback loop where we send messages back to the leadership and say, what you're doing is not right. Uh, but uh, sometimes they do good things or two. And that's how the circle works. Now, I think you may have read um, Lawrence of Arabia's idea that, you know, if you can instill a dream in a human, uh, it sometimes creates a belly, a fire in their bellies. And it's unbelievable what you can do when you have a fire in the belly and uh, against all uh, conventional wisdom, people go on to do magical things. We won't do that in our studio, but we try to inculcate that idea that idea is more important than anything you can bring to the table. So, um, yeah, you know, when you, look at the, uh, when you look at the giants of prescience and imagination, you think of Jules Verne, Wells, um, Asimov, and A.C. Clarke in our own field of expertise. Look at this, 1954 and what happened in 1965. Uh, and uh, uh, this is unbelievable what people are able to even visualize uh, and make happen. 1954 versus what happened in 1969. Um, so now, <laughs> I don't want to go into deep philosophy, which is not my expertise, but you know, we live in a dynamic universe. Everything is moving. And if you look at just the Newtonian physics of this movement, the energies involved are unbelievable, unfathomable. And it's in this area that uh, we do our tiny bit of work we are a very, very insignificant um, you know, species uh, living perhaps in an extremely insignificant surroundings, as you can see in these charts. And add to that, there is a lot of uncertainty about where we are headed and um, how our planet is moving along our so along our, our, our galaxy and in the universe. So these are new things. In the last hundred years or so, we've gotten to be more detailed. Uh, and now, <laughs> I think in the past few years, out of UCLA's work and out of uh, some of the works that's going on out there in the Atacama Desert uh, Observatories, um, we know that there are things like giant black holes and in, uh, in, um, happening in the middle of our little galaxy and that is moving around at unfathomable speed. So uh, what all this deals with really is a sense of uncertainty. And uh, for instance, who would have predicted C19 environment uh, uh, that we are in today? And so going ahead into the future, uh, it's very hard to predict. So uh, this is true with many of our professions, particularly in architecture. We are dealing with wicked problems and wicked problems are those which are mostly solved out of bounds. You bring another parameter in and, uh, and solve it. So uh, we use things like heuristics, which talks about um, uh, uh, how certain complex problems uh, present themselves and how they are solved. Uh, these are some of the things that everybody knows about. The most important one, right, being uh, Peter Principle that says that if you give somebody a lot of money, uh, they will find ways to use it. And uh, that's how it goes. Anyhow. So um, the things we talk about and show in our class is really about synthesis, bringing things together. It's a kind of intelligence that architects do better, in my opinion, uh, than many other professions. And uh, uh, debate and discussion is at the core of getting to a good idea. A little bit about space philosophy, if you want to call it that. <laughs> I know some of you have met this man. I did not. Uh, I know, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he did some magical things. Uh, 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 here in the Southland, and uh, um, uh, he was the one, uh, in my opinion, who first said, hey, listen, guys, uh, 
Earth is a space, spaceship with finite resources. And that rings in the back of all my students' heads when I talk about what it is that we are about. It's all about planet Earth, folks. Uh, here are some of the new ideas on what people want to do about uh, space. Uh, some people think uh, they want uh, to preserve human, uh, human species outside of planet Earth if things go wrong on Earth. Uh, some people think we want to preserve Earth and continue to make her more beautiful. Um, our own Dean from our USC School of Architect, uh, from the USC uh, Arts and Sciences talked about uh, bringing the universe, uh, bringing the solar system first uh, into the economic sphere of influence for our species benefit and for Earth. Joseph Campbell, you know, uh, the uh, person who was um, instrumental in educating uh, um, George Lucas about Star Wars, talked about the return of the hero, going out, exploring and coming back to tell the story. Uh, Freeman Dyson, this wonderful man who is no more, um, uh, you know, his idea was that you are looking out into this universe and not seeing anything. It's cold, it's black. Um, and what do we do? Our purpose perhaps is to beautify the universe. Frank White, who I'm uh, happily watching on, uh, uh, on Chatbox now, uh, talks about the overview effect. You know, it's been known, Frank, it's been known since the inception of human space flight that people go out, look at planet Earth and see, whoa, that's what it really is. There is nothing better than experience uh, for education. And uh, uh, Frank has been talking about the overview effect for a long time. And most recently, a thought has occurred to us as a species, and that is we must protect what we put out there not just mess with it, but protect out there. And um, in that area, I think uh, there is, a, um, there is a, a, a rush and a push to make sure that everything we put out stays where it is, uh, does not clutter, and uh, we are still looking at how to protect our space heritage. Okay, now coming to the immediate tab, uh, um, recent uh, past, uh, as you know, um, um, our current administration under President Trump uh, announced uh, uh, a push uh, uh, to go back to the moon and Mars. Um, this is exactly what was said, uh, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to make it happen. We need to have policies. And the first policy that came out of the current administration said that we should go back to the moon and Mars. And um, we followed that in our class. And if you can Google the AIAA, uh, uh, the IAC uh, proceedings, you'll see our Adam project from 2018. Uh, and then um, uh, we have celebrity visit us uh, once in a while in our little studio. It's one of those rare classes where we have more reviewers than students. And um, we enjoy that every fall. The, the new ones coming up, we'll be looking at it again, uh, uh, return to the moon. So in the spring, I teach in the School of um, Architecture where I get uh, very visual responses to hard problems. They ask me, what can space do for the eight, um, the seven point some billion people who live on Earth? And we, uh, they know that uh, uh, space is the place where we use pure solar energy uh, for all our powering, all our instruments and keeping our astronaut safe. They know that um, uh, humanity uh, uh, can exist uh, or, or off Earth and in the vacuum of space, in the hard space environment, only because we know how to run our environment control and life support systems. They know that we have been uh, recycling our water you know, progressively to the point that we are nearly closing the loop, uh, you know, even containing our sweat. That is, uh, um, that is uh, the humidity in the cabin is brought back uh, you know, to you to just support, uh, support your life. So these are things that we're doing, not to mention uh, communication is happening in such a rapid 
um, the advances are happening in such a rapid manner uh, that um, these are things that humanity uses or starting to use now on planet Earth. As you know, this is how uh, messy the whole wired, hardwired world looks like. Uh, but most of all, I like to think that uh, when you put people into space and spacecraft, the most important thing, obviously, is, is people and how to keep them safe and um, how to protect their, um, their uh, psyche during missions. We know that um, you know, there is um, a certain amount of input and output. Um, then most importantly, again, uh, it is about uh, the human part of uh, living in space uh, that I'd like to think space architecture is about. It's more than the physiology. It's more than the physical. Now, we know and we've been doing some very interesting works uh, in, uh, in uh, our domain here on Earth for many years. And uh, we know that we can use some of these ideas um, to, uh, to help people live better in space. Hundreds of people live uh, months at a time completely, um, uh, um, completely isolated from the world. And uh, so the architects asked me, so what are we doing in space architecture to, to take care of the 10 billion people who are going to be with us in the coming future? And the growth is not going to be where we are, but it's going to be still on planet Earth. But we have to think about that. How can, architect, how can space technologies help with, uh, with uh, humanity? And these are the questions that architects ask all the time. We know there is a greenhouse emissions going on. We know that solar activity is involved. Uh, we know that all of, all of it cannot be blamed on our species. Uh, are you talking to me? Uh, <laughs> I hear, I'm talking to you, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, you're looking at uh, different um, happenings around our solar system uh, caused by the sun that causes some of these things too. So we need to keep that balance in mind rather than blame ourselves for everything that happens. We know that uh, uh, fertilization is happening at an extreme pace and the greening of, of earth is happening. Though we are also messing up uh, with the particulate matter and pollution is rampant. Uh, we know that uh, some of the uh, attributes of space technology can be used for travel um, uh, James Lovelock comes to mind where he talks about uh, the, um, uh, if somebody can mute their mic, better be good. Um, uh, Professor Lovelock says, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but climate change. you're past your time. <laughs> okay, am I, did I hear something? Yep, Madhu, you're past your time. Okay, we good. Like schedule. Good. It's coming right to it, <laughs> right to it, thank you. So, um, adaptation is something that we can do. Finally, Buckminster Fuller again tells us that, you know, um, the most important thing about living on Earth is about taking care of planet Earth, and we have to learn to do that. So here are some of the concepts that we do in our class. Um, every day we are thinking about new ideas, and this is what I intend to do um, in the coming fall term. We are looking at thoughts about what we are going to be doing on the moon, and how we're going to do that. And we're going to use architects' help as much we can uh, in this program. So coming to today's program, you'll hear about uh, graduate programs uh, happening in space architecture. You'll hear about orbital habitats, lunar habitats, uh, Mars settlements, and uh, most importantly, a human needs for long duration missions, which is what anything human have to do uh, when you go into places like this. Uh, request that uh, we micro mute the microphones, uh, 10 minutes for speakers, followed by five minutes of Q&A from the audience. Um, and uh, then we'll have a panel discussion. Okay, now ready to go, guys. Sorry if I took a little more, a few more minutes. 
Okay, can uh, stop share. There you go. Oh, I'm five minutes over time. Okay, good. Guys, uh, uh, let us go to our uh, program. Ken, uh, yes. Can we go right to Olga. Olga, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I can start sharing my screen. Okay, go for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, share. Okay, so uh, well said, Madhu. Thank you very much for nice overall um, description of what and why you think architecture is important and why the mind is different, I agree with you. Well, uh, I have to uh, go and talk a little bit more about this, maybe a little bit bureaucratic, but it's about our very, very uh, interesting and active uh, Space Architecture Technical Committee, which is part also of uh, AAA. And we started as a subcommittee and then we're promoted to a technical committee. So there are uh, several of our uh, members uh, on this panel, including Barbara, Melody, Anastasia is applying, I know, right? Uh, Scott was uh, very uh, active and uh, you were a chair, I think, some, at some point. And I'm currently a chair for two years uh, and uh, then uh, Sandra will continue as a chair after me. Uh, and uh, so the next, again, uh, so that's uh, all started when a group of uh, active people, active professionals, not only architects, engineers, uh, scientists, got together in 2002 in Houston, and uh, we came up with ideas of what is uh, space architecture uh, is, and it was a space architecture charter. Uh, and uh, formulated as space architecture is a theory and practice of designing and building inhabited environments in outer space. So it's very broad. It includes a lot of faci different facilities, habitats, and vehicles. And environments, uh, it's orbital and uh, surface, planetary surface, uh, on the surface, uh, transit habitats, uh, and um, uh, mobility systems and all of that. Also, Earth analogs, it's also part of it. Uh, it's very important to design well and design and test as much as possible on, on, uh, on Earth before that. And uh, so, again, um, continue going. I don't want to uh, bore you with this uh, bureaucratic and our official uh, kind of uh, uh, PowerPoint here. So I will go to our website because we also have spacearchitect.org uh, website. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Uh, and uh, so again, you see Barbara is located at one of the events. Uh, uh, is it Olga? We, yeah. we, we cannot see the site yet, uh, Olga. Okay, you, okay. You need so, to share that screen, yeah, not the yeah. slide. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I will share this. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. So it was before when I tested it worked uh, perfectly well, but okay, it changes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, organizing space architecture symposiums, and we have sessions, space architecture sessions at uh, different international national events. Uh, and at uh, International Oceanological Congress, uh, in the International Conference on Environmental Systems, and uh, also upcoming this new uh, conference, uh, Ascent, that happens in November this, this year. Uh, we will have several space architecture sessions and including artificial gravity panel, which is also very, of course, interesting. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we're open uh, for uh, em embracing uh, any you know, new members. We have uh, students and again, as I said, professionals and our group is growing with, uh, and doing more and more work with the industry. Uh, and uh, okay, so to keep everything on time, I guess uh, I will uh, 
skip uh, yeah so here is our events i think yes uh, this is a picture from our website again uh, i will go uh, to my second part of my presentation talking about our master program at the university of houston and uh, if anybody has any questions about space architecture technical committee and how to become a member what we're doing so of course we will have q a later on so that said, I think I will just go to our website instead of going to my another PowerPoint. And here is uh, our uh, website, oops, oops, trying to make it bigger, but so. Okay, and uh, we uh, part of the College of Engineering at the University of Houston. Uh, we're currently with the uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering and uh, uh, it's, uh, there are many programs uh, and there are many studios, as, as Matthew said, like, you know, three hour course uh, here and there, like at different universities. Uh, and, uh, but we have the only uh, master program in the world, uh, that's Master of Science in Space Architecture. And we also have a dual degree in aerospace engineering and space architecture. So for like a little uh, pitch here, so for only uh, uh, 60 hours or like 40 hours, uh, well, you can uh, get a dual degree at the, uh, at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have our celebrities who is visiting us very often. You can see it on our website. Uh, so uh, Buzz uh, has been uh, visiting us since the program or well, the center was created uh, in late uh, 20th century before the Master of Science Space Architecture was accredited uh, by Technical High, uh, Texas Higher Education Board in beginning of 2000 years, to, uh, 2000s. Um, and um, so he's an uh, interesting guy, of course, and he's, when he's, uh, he's visiting, he's uh, a lot of ideas still, so that's very cool. Uh, we also have uh, on this, you can see there, uh, it's our sponsor was visiting us, it's Sasakawa, and the uh, founder of the program, Dr. Uh, Professor Larry Bell, is there. We also have uh, uh, one of our faculty is uh, on the panel, Chris Kennedy, so um, you can also ask him questions about our program uh, later on. Uh, have uh, again uh, active students who work uh, it uh, starting at the, their internships while they are still in the program. Uh, they are uh, working at uh, NASA and Boeing and uh, all NASA contractors and new upcoming uh, companies like Axiom Space, uh, Iron Rings, uh, Intuitive Machines, and stuff like that. Uh, and um, I probably missed something, but again, I have uh, our graduates on the panel, so they may correct me or add something about. And we also have, uh, I have quite few students uh, and graduates uh, as the participants, so they may also chat with you guys if anybody is interested in it. But we also can do it in Q&A. Uh, so uh, I, uh, what else would I would like to tell you guys that Again, echoing what Manhu was saying, I usually say, yes, yeah, it's philosophy of bringing things together and thinking how, how you design uh, the habitats that is not only for uh, humans to survive, but actually live in it and enjoy. And so that means that will be, they will be more productive they will uh, be inspired by uh, what they are doing and uh, they will do more and uh, without uh, going crazy in this uh, enclosed and dangerous places when they go to space. Uh, and um, again, uh, the space architecture is uh, such a unique um, discipline uh, that allows you to pursue your ideas in different ways. It can be more about the settlements and large scale systems. It can be about specific element of the habitat that you can really work and uh, um, advance. Uh, uh, and it can be mobility systems uh, and uh, all, sort, all sort of it. But most importantly, you need to think about big pro uh, problems and how they 
how to uh, work on them and put these things together and um, how to help uh, the environment and help people so without destroying each other. So that's how we also relate it very much to our own planet Earth and how we our uh, projects also uh, good and uh, applicable and our work is applicable to uh, our own environment here on Earth. So I'm sorry, maybe I was too um, long, but uh, here it is and uh, we'll be ready for Q&A, right, Ken? Or we will do it later? Yes, we will do Q&A uh, for a few, three or four minutes now with you, mm -hmm. uh, Olga, and then we'll go to regular. Okay, questions. Uh, uh, um, anybody in our group want to ask Olga a question? Uh, Olga, I was, I was there when uh, Larry Bell and Guy Trotty uh, were running that program. And I recall spending a summer in, summer in Houston. I, <laughs> I'd rather be elsewhere. But anyway, uh, uh, doing this. Questions for Olga, please. I, I see a, a, a comment in the box which says, SIXA is one of the most useful programs with an amazing environment and valuable professors. I had two wonderful years over there from Masa Espan. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Maxa. Yes, she is a recent graduate and uh, did great work. Uh, well, I see also another uh, question here in Q&A about the PhD program. Uh, and uh, this uh, with PhD, although I completely uh, agree that uh, it will be would be proper to have a PhD in space architecture, but, but we are not there yet. And um, perhaps uh, in the upcoming years, it, it, it will be uh, available. Uh, Jocelyn Carr says hello. Albert Rajkumar says hello. Um, so, so you have a good following. Uh, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hello. I, I would have a question. Can I have a Go for question? it. Go for it. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Olga, for these uh, nice presentations and the overviews. I have a question, which is maybe um, you know more uh, of a starting point for conversation, but maybe we can um, you can briefly um, you know talk about it. What are the, you know, in, I'm sure in space architects, of course, people get a, a huge variety of skill sets additional to their previous um, studies. And um, uh, what, you know, and probably not all go into space, but what do you think um, are the unique skill sets uh, these architecture students get in, in your master course? And, and what, um, and, well, yes, and what do they do um, afterwards when they finish their studies? I guess that, that, that is a good question, Barbara. We will bring that in the in the panel question. I think it'll be okay. Fine. much better. Sorry. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, thank you so much, Olga. We are yeah, going there, on to. There is one. Yes, there is one question. It's very quick from Andrew. Okay. It's about this remote opportunity. Okay. Yeah, uh, we. Uh, I have actually a few students uh, who are not present in Houston those uh, who continue and the new students and uh, uh, we also i want to have face-to-face -face, uh, component and especially because we are setting up our virtual reality lab yes. uh, now and where you can test your ideas and your projects uh, but uh, it, it is available so uh, and i think it will stay even after COVID, so this component will be still available. It's it's useful. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you, Olga. You know, um, uh, just as you finish uh, a Sixa presentation, our our next speaker is a Sixa graduate, and we welcome Anastasia. Thank you so much, Mahu. I'm so excited to be here, uh, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm live from Big Bear Lake. It's like it's uh, two hours away from Los Angeles. It's pretty much nice area and I'm pretty much isolating from the world and working on my company. So let me um, share my screen. Yeah. 
so um uh, this is really uh i remember that we have only 10 minutes so i try to shorten presentation uh to the kind of points that i really want to discuss um so we are the company we are based we usually based in los angeles and currently we're working remotely uh we have uh four people as a core team and uh, six people as uh, contractors as well as we have uh six interns that have been with us and uh, so we uh probably i would say that the first and only company that focusing on interior design solutions for space habitats in particular uh how uh, you know, interior design effects, mood of a uh, space crew, and um, what we can do about it, right? Because as, as um, since missions becoming longer, we need to make sure that our mental health stays <laughs> sane. And um, let me go to the next slide. So there is a few problems regarding space habitats at the current moment. There is a uh, you know, a lot of launch companies just popping up. There's just so much uh, capacity in terms of, uh, you know, sending payload, but there's not so much payload to send actually. Um, according to Space Fund, the venture capital, they say that there's, you know, there's, around, it's, there's gonna be around 40 companies that are gonna, 40 launch companies that are gonna die in the next uh, five years, because there's no such a big de demand on that. And uh, so, and because of the rising demand of um, private space sector, um, there's no developed solutions um, yet. Um, the habitable area uh, cannot be suitable if you don't if you don't ensure the combination combination optimal functioning while being cost effective are affordable and met and also uh, since uh, we all remember that sending something to space is extremely costly and volume and uh, uh, weight is uh, the one of the biggest drivers um, we also pay huge attention on how we use our space efficiently. Um, and we uh, make sure that we use um, uh, each zone of our habitat can be used in uh, multiple ways. And um, of course, psychological, physiological issues that related to the long duration space travel. And uh, we believe that design can actually eliminate uh, the struggle and uh, decreased conflicts arising between crew members. So we are designing efficient, lightweight and reconfigurable furniture. Uh, I would say components, I can't really call it furniture, right? So it's uh, um, space habitat components inside of space habitats to support well-being in space. And um, we also, um, we also, as I mentioned before, uh, paying probably the biggest attention towards uh, psychological effects of living and working in space. Um, and uh, uh, there's the question why the inside of space habitat is critical towards our future as space faring civilization. And uh, I would say that when uh, as humanity pushing the boundaries of space travel we um, we are gonna to live in space. Uh, the way how we're gonna live in space is often neglected. Living in space exploration in a great danger, both physically and mentally. And uh, so far, going in space is risky, and the off-planet environment is naturally hostile to humans. And moreover, as you see in the slide, NASA identified that the second biggest risk facing people here living in space after radiation is uh, crew behavioral health. Living, uh, working and living in tiny space habitats uh, where there's no runaway, no retreat, no forests, no, you know, no possibility to go outdoors. 
and enjoy the waterfall or, you know, staying in the river flow. And during the long duration missions, astronauts and space tourists um, uh, the struggle of seeing the same people in the small space performing routine tasks and space habitat becomes a place likely arising conflicts and not everyone can tolerate the isolation loneliness encountered in long space flights but we believe that the wealth throughout human-centered design can significantly significantly relieve these issues um, there's just really funny numbers. Um, I actually, uh, I'm gonna talk about more, but uh, let me tell you first or what first thought I have. Um, talking about our users, uh, 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 as I said before, our users, not only astronauts, but space tourists, and as a total number, there are only 50, uh, 566 people uh, from 41 countries have gone to space. Of those, only seven people have been an orbit tourist, and um, these numbers can, can say something about, um, you know, the attractiveness of going to space. Um, probably all of us who is watching this pan, uh, this uh, meeting, we all would go to space, no matter what, right? If we had uh, sufficient funds. Uh, but uh, uh, this um, this um, slide shows that 56, almost 56,000 people can afford to go to space, but they're not going. And I think the reason that is because there's no such a, you know, thing, there's no such a strong argument to go to space. Uh, all the space, uh, orbital space tourists, they were staying on the ISS and the experience, you, you all saw how ISS looks inside. And, um, you know, for space tourists, it's not something that they would love to stay, where they would love to stay. Um, so yeah, the low number of the on the previous slide is a clear proof that that there should be an entertainment that only can be done in space, nowhere else. Um, we need to get more people uh, interested in space voyages by providing conditions in real realm of space tourism. Um, there is a whole industry of space entertainment, entertainment need to be invented because I mean in the in the end of the day, just everybody likes to have fun, you know, like, like, like you and me, you know. Uh, so for example, it could be floating spine. And I don't really like when, um, you know, when somebody proposed a space hotel concept and uh, all the entertainment that done there is basically what people, what rich people do on earth and then transitioned, kind of translated it into weightlessness. And um, there's, we should start from uh, basics. We should start from origins and think about not Earth experience like this luxurious experience, but uh, how you know fluids react, fluids react differently, how movements are different. Um, yeah. So the projects that we have uh, we worked so far, I <coughs> I started. Um, I began interested in the space architecture from 2016. Uh, when I was in the third year of my school in ur urban planning, uh, I was uh, studying it in Siberia, Russia, and there I learned that this is the field, that space architecture is something that uh, fully attract my, my everything. And from that, from that moment, I started to work on a variety of projects. In 2018, I, I was I, I entered uh, SIXA uh, with uh, uh, Olga, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> where Olga was a professor. And uh, there was an, a wonderful one and a half year of study. There's only, uh, there's three semester, it's three semester program. And on screen you can see that uh, like three uh, top three projects that have been done there um, uh, during the study. And, and below is um, something that we done uh, before or after. Let me see. Oops. And uh, you know our core team combines um, 
expertise in uh, architecture as well as aerospace. Um, and uh, our chief technology officer, you could see it on uh, him on the left. Uh, he, he designed the crease pattern of Starshade. It's, uh, it's a huge reflector that's gonna be sent to space someday. <laughs> And he, uh, we, we're, working both, we're working together on solving uh, how to build the most, the lightest uh, configurations possible for uh, interior elements of space habitats. And on the right, uh, in the middle, uh, which is uh, on, the, on the right, the, in the middle of the, the project called Desert Snowflake. Uh, we, my friends and I, we went through this competition, we won the People's Choice Prize. And from that moment, I just really realized that uh, I I want to you know found a company, and here we go into ta in uh, December 2018. I founded Store Amenities after graduating from Y Combinator Startup School um, in September 2018, and after finishing my uh, researchship um, visiting researchship at MIT Media Lab. You see the project on the right uh, top right. Um, yeah. It's really pretty short. So let me see. We have, we have to move on. Uh, and so stage. at this stage, um, you know, the projects that you saw in the previous slide is, uh, you, you notice that there's pretty much variety of projects. And uh, Stormwind is, um, is focusing on near term, I would say 10, 15, 20 years uh, of uh, human space flight, we are, and it's, that's actually the reason why I decided to transition from building and, you know, creating concept of whole space habitat towards interior design, uh, because um, systems engineering is something that should be done by experts and it's, uh, it's uh, purely engineering. And um, I think what's, uh, what we should also handle in long duration missions is uh, how we're gonna feel in the space habitats. And this is the reason why we're focusing what goes inside of space habitats. Um, so, and uh, so far we, we have uh, two pending requests for proposals. We, I mean, we already signed proposals to Action Space, another company, and they're interested to work with us. I, can really disclose more than I just more than now more than uh, this information, and uh, you know, uh, as space architect, I think that we are all understanding the importance of educating our customers and the crowd, and actually probably it's the reason why we're hosting this meeting right now, and. Uh, uh, in the recent article that's on Storamentia's website, I compared architecture, space architecture, uh, either, um, you know, space architecture is a part of architecture or how it's really, you know, work together. And uh, I would say that no matter what kind of architecture it is, it, it pursues the mission of enhancing the human experience. Um, this is exact same mission when it comes to the space arch uh, small architecture of tiny houses you know this huge moment of tiny houses that are popping up nowadays uh, people moving people realizing that they, they can live uh, they can do more with less they can live smaller in smaller places but they can uh, spend more money on things that they enjoy so, you know, small apartments and urbanized uh, places and Arctic and any other remote places. Anna, Anna, time However, to wind up. Time to wind um, up in the... Oh, sorry. Time, uh, time One second, I cannot up. hear you. Uh, um, you're past your time One and second. Uh, we should move on. Oops. Well, I mean, guess you're saying that I need to kind of um, up, yeah. <laughs> sum up everything, yeah. right? I can really hear. Okay. So um, I'll I'll go faster, and uh, uh, <laughs> no, you, know, you, like, you want you want slide. to stop, and we can have a discussion 
about your okay uh, i need to turn off my headphones because they don't work okay um uh, uh, can can we start the okay. next uh, uh, next speaker because we have to stay uh, approximately on time <laughs> Okay. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sure. Definitely. I I can hear. I the the, the sound Anna, is dis Anna, we distort, can, distorted. We can, uh, we can discuss your ideas uh, uh, during panel discussion now. Mm. Uh, thank you. How will I fix it? Oh. Okay. okay uh, Mark, are you ready? Uh, yes. Um. So we are moving on uh, from. Uh, uh, general idea and philosophies of space architecture, the more focused arena of going back to the moon and on to Mars. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Cohen, and he will talk about lunar daytime. Mark, go for it. Oops, just a second, I need to. Yeah, we can see you, Mark. We can see your slides. Right, I just need to figure out um... How to get the uh, the right view? Yeah. Slideshow. And click on there your. There we go. Click on your screen. Click on your screen. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so let me go back. Okay, so this talk is about the lunar daytime project to create behavioral experiments in a space analog living and working environment. And this is a, based on a paper I wrote for the International Conference on Environmental Systems, uh, which did not occur last month. But the paper, the URL for the paper is in red at the bottom of the slide, if anyone wants to download it. OK, so in terms of the st state of the art of current habitat analog behavioral research, there's, there are a lot of limitations. Uh, first, there's the, the challenge of producing scientifically valid results. Historically, analog studies have produced only qualitative results in the form of uh, qualitative observations, surveys of subjects, and uh, least, least valid of all, so-called subject matter expert surveys. Um, what lunar daytime will do is demonstrate the use and efficacy of a modifiable environmental analog to, that's capable of producing empirical, measurable, and quantitative data sets <clears throat> to measure effects in, in crew behavioral response. Researchers must be able to make and control changes to the desired envir environment, to the environment as a, an independent variable. And then the crew behavioral response is the dependent variable or variables. So uh, the, the purpose, uh, I, uh, <coughs> actually this just repeats it. Okay, so why do we call it lunar daytime? Because the idea is that these, analog simulations will run for 14 days, the half a day of the, the moon's uh, diurnal cycle that receives sunlight until there is a nuclear reactor on the moon or there are uh, power collectors, solar collectors mounted on the so-called peaks of eternal light at the South Pole and then that power is beamed to the habitat until that those power supplies are available, human visits to the moon will be limited to the daylight period, which will probably be for at least the first 10 to 20 years. So um, an advantage of doing 14 day simulations is it would allow us to conduct more missions, providing a larger sample size, resulting in more robust statistical analyses. So in terms of uh, the idea of a, a modifiable or customizable um, habitat interior. This is an idea that's not new or unique. Uh, this is a drawing by David Nixon, one of the earliest space architects, showing eight options for uh, subdividing 
in outfitting a uh, a space station module interior. So the two major objectives are to create a space habitat analog facility specifically designed to accommodate experimental modifications in the physical and perceptual environment and demonstrate the ability of this environment to, as a behavioral laboratory to investigate the critical human factors that play important roles in human health, well-being, and uh, productivity in an isolated and confined environment. To the, toward that end, the Lunar Daylight team will build a module uh, at the multi-purpose research station at the University of North Dakota, which currently consists of a five-module habitat analog complex. And this is the first module uh, that was completed on the first EPSCOR grant North Dakota received. I was a consultant for this project. Uh, this is what that looks like from the outside, and it includes a rover simulator with suit ports and spacesuits to conduct simulated ex EVAs. This is what it looked like about a year and a half ago after the second EPSCOR grant, and they added four modules to the original one, which is the, the larger one in the middle. This is our plan to modify it to support the uh, lunar daytime study. What we will do is put our, um, our custom, our custom module here for the lunar daytime hab and move lab one over to this position, add an EVA module and, and relocate the rover docking port to that. So we have quite a few hypotheses. Uh, I won't go into these in detail, um, but we're pr pursuing ways to make each of these testable and falsifiable. Uh, so the first one is concerns <coughs> the privacy of sleep quarters. The second module, the importance and value of windows, either real or virtual. Um, circulation pattern. This hypothesis states uh, that uh, creating a circulation loop will elicit functional and crew interaction differences from a non-loop tree pattern or dead end circulation pattern, such as we now have on ISS. These differences would include increased social interaction and efficiency in response to emergency egress and access and to enhance normal operations. And this, these pictures show um, the, actually the mirror, which was a, uh, a tree or dead end uh, circulation pattern versus one of the space station freedom configuration drawings where you see there is a circulation loop or what they called a racetrack. Uh, and then hypothesis four, a habitat with physical order and visually clean will increase work output and positive effects in crew function, mood, performance, and productivity. And uh, here's a comparison of a, a new, a recent mock-up by Lockheed Martin for the Lunar Gateway versus the reality today in the U.S. Destiny Lab. And if you look at this picture of the U.S. Destiny Lab, probably the most orderly thing is the Hawaiian shirt the astronauts wearing. So we have expected results, which are to facilitate a new paradigm of behavioral research that moves beyond passive observation and so-called expert opinions that have dominated past surveys and quasi-experiments and uh, bridge the results from qualitative and descriptive studies to quantitative ones. So that's, that's basically it. Questions? Thank you, Mark. Questions for Mark. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I I have a question. Go for it, Barbara. Okay, uh, thanks. 
Thanks, Mark. Uh, there were a couple of, of super interesting points. I'd like to um, you know, point you to uh, the picture of the destiny module with the Hawaiian shirt, the orderly pattern uh, of the Hawaiian shirt. Do you think that in the future that can change considering the fact that you know, ISS and also any kind of uh, lunar outpost um, will, you know, if it's, you know, paid by a governmental agency, you know, the crews will come again and again and nobody will clean up after them and they have many, many things and they might also have restrictions on bringing things down or how that could change, you know, that the, the messiness goes away. It's like a hotel room which never gets cleaned, basically. Um, well, I, I think there's a lot to unpack in your question, but first of all, uh, you got to recognize that when the uh, the rack designs were developed for ISS, the, the, there there was no concept of how many additional cables and tubes and hoses and wires and things would would need to be uh, deployed from the from the racks, and the, so the racks, you know, were packed in as closely as possible. And I, I think the first st step is that there needs to be a lot more uh, utility chase volume, both in the, the equivalent space of standoff, of the standoff area or volume, and also between the racks. I, I, I think that in a future lab, uh, there needs to be a plenum between racks where all of those wires could be contained and uh, controlled. And I'm not sure how big that plenum would be, but it would, it would, it would probably be on the order of at least 10 centimeters, maybe 20 centimeters between each rack. I mean, I, I think a, a lot of it was, you know, uh, what Madhu quoted as, as a wicked problem. He didn't get it right, of course, because the definition of, it, it was Nigel Cross, the British design methodologist who said, planning problems are wicked problems because it requ they require you to predict the future which is extremely difficult to factor into a design problem. That's a, that's a good point, Mark. Uh, uh, I agree with you that the wicked problem uh, defies, uh, uh, defies uh, a statement. And uh, 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 we know a wicked problem uh, when we are in it, uh, rather than uh, make explicit statements about it. Good one, thank you. Now, you know, we'll have more discussion on these later on, but we are moving on uh, to our next wonderful speaker. Uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is ready? Yes, I'm ready. Go for it. Can you see that? Yes, uh, we can, uh, Brand and... Uh, uh, we can see it very clearly. Go for it. Okay. Well, uh, the title of this short talk will be different for a reason, and I want to describe why these concepts are different. And some of these concepts are dated, but actually they're not outdated. And that's the nature of space. It's pretty exclusive in terms of what flies, but I think perceptually we can't assume all that flies is right. There are a lot of good unbuilt concepts. And um, you know, I think that uh, I want to show some that I've been involved with, but uh, others too. So um, let's move on. What you see here is a typical lunar lander and pretty much modeled after the Apollo style. Makes a lot of sense. Um, when you have your crew module on the top for uh, an abort to orbit or your descent stage and then you have an ascent stage to be able to do that as well. Um, you like uh, centerline thrust. Those are all good reasons and for our return to the moon these are acceptable approaches. What I wanted to introduce is something that may come a little bit later where you use the typical strategy of almost any cargo carrier, whether it's a ship or an airplane, and you provide a cargo hold, and then you manage the CG. So in this case, on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, there is an open space that can accommodate modular entities, anything from, you know, a cargo module to a crew module, 
and outboard or um, the propulsion system. And this gets away from the centerline thrust, um, it challenges the engineers, but no more than designing a 747 or any multi-engine aircraft where you may have asymmetric thrust. You can manage it. We've got control systems that can do it. But nonetheless, it gives you the advantage of being close to the deck. You can lower your payload. Otherwise, uh, you've got crew and cargo issues of going up and down ladders. And spacesuit knees just don't bend like normal knees. So uh, going up and down a ladder causes uh, some risk to the crew. Um, this is an image, and again, a little dated, but uh, back then there were space artists, and Paul Hudson was one of the best. Uh, he painted this concept, and you can see on here there's a crew module. It's coming in for the same kind of trajectory that we use for Apollo. And on the outside are the elements that can be replaced on the surface. They're single layer packaging and they're easily accessed. So rather than trying to bury something and have to remove one ORU to get to another one, uh, these uh, are designed for servicing uh, on the surface and also in orbit. Now that's only one part of an infrastructure. Um, what you saw was a structural frame and trunnions much like used on the shuttle that carry uh, the individual elements that are delivered to the lunar surface. But uh, this is a concept for a lunar base that uses the same thing. The difference in this one is that um, we don't wanna bring a lot of equipment to do site improvement. And that's gonna be a major challenge. Um, so, what we're doing in this is we bring um, footings. The footings rest on the surface and then we jack up to a level plane. We bring in the elements using those same trunnions that are the structural load path. We elevate the modules so they have precision uh, positioning and all of the um, connections are understood and it's level. So rather than trying to level the you know, regolith and all the other things that are on the surface, we provide a separate uh, surface that gives a leveling. And also you can see in this that we're bringing the equivalent of, let's say, gutter stock that you use on a building, thin folded uh, sheets of metal. These then are placed on the top, regolith is placed on top of that. So it packs up very well. For delivery, and then it's unfolded, and you get that geometric stiffening that will allow the regolith to be loaded on top. I want to talk a little bit about uh, EVA. Um, we are so assumed to seeing people in suits, we don't think of it differently. But there's good reason for having a spacecraft rather than a spacesuit in the weightless environment. Um, we've done very well with spacesuits, but nonetheless, we can do better with a crew enclosure that is at the same cabin atmosphere as the host, the same gases, there will be no pre-breathe, and one of the most revealing uh, statistics that I've seen recently is it takes on average 58 hours for someone to do an EVA. That's the planning inside in order to get out the door. Some of that is pre-breathing, but there's a lot of other times. So that's more than a normal work week. We can do better. And with a single person spacecraft here, you can see how you can get straight into the spacecraft and then be able to use the benefit of manipulators. But you still need uh, suits on the surface. This is one that was developed a number of years ago. And um, rather than having the separation that you would, like on this chart for the uh, normal EMU, there's a helmet separation, there's a separation for the gloves, and there's a mid-torso separation. All of those represent entry paths for regolith, you know, the dust and dirt that you'd collect when you do an EVA on the surface. So by having a single plane in the back, you can see it before you get in, clean it, and be able to minimize the dust contamination inside the suit. The other benefit of that design is that on the right hand side, rather than a backpack, which throws the CG you know, to the back, you have a uh, carved out space in that rear section. 
So the head can actually be inside of that. And then you use the sides of it to package heavier elements like batteries and other things. So you're beginning to move the CG forward to allow the uh, astronauts to work better on the surface. This is, these are some design sketches leading up to the rear entry uh, concept. It's not new. Uh, we're starting to go to that with the new US spacesuit, but uh, Russians and Soviets have used uh, a rear entry for a long time. And it's a pretty good concept. It allows the arms to remain in place, the boots and everything else in place. The faceted helmet on this particular concept really allows you to do something that you can't do now. And that's put some uh, displays inside. Um, there's no opportunity to do that with it. And as well, the flat surfaces, if you make that uh, thicker, it's not distorted. If you make a bubble helmet thicker, then it becomes a lens and it distorts your view. Um, a mock-up was built of this. It actually uses parts from the current spacesuit for the lower torso and for the arms and was flown on uh, the KC-135 when that was operational, flying 16G parabolas and looking at uh, entry, exit, and other aspects of that design. Harrison Schmidt, uh, who has lunar EVA experience, also tried it on and but had great visibility and uh, appreciated some of the improvements of that concept. Um, there was for a period of time, 10 years, uh, when the suit was um, in the uh, Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. But you can see it's a little bit different. And in this uh, view, the tines that are sticking out serve another purpose. They um, actually lock into the flight deck of a lunar hopper. And not everybody knows, but uh, you flew the lunar module standing up. Some of that was because the suit really didn't sit well. You can't bend it so that it's in a normal seated posture, but also standing up is a pretty good way to land on the moon. So this concept allows the crew member to be able to lock in to a flight deck and be able to use the features that are in that helmet and be able to fly it. And the skin is so thin on one of these low pressure landers like they had on the moon, we're just eliminating it. So you don't need it. You can fly standing on the deck and use this as a hopper to uh, go from place to place on the moon. The other opportunity too in that design is to have an MMU type connection. Um, both the Russian and the US MMUs had a blind connection. You had to back into it in order to fly it. With this concept, you can step forward, lock into it, and then you can use the forward portion of that for approaching uh, either satellites or other things in order to, uh, you know, dock to them. This is, uh, again, another Paul Hudson illustration, and it shows the bins on the lower portion of this for transporting elements on the moon. And they're, again, they're easily accessed because they're down low. There's a Mars concept, which has a, a, a smaller backpack and it works on being a little bit more lightweight because of the higher gravity. And one last thing that I'd like to address, and actually Scott Howe was uh, a co-author on the paper, but uh, when we're looking at the moon right now in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the uh, Cygnus module. That's the diameter of the human element that would be part of the lunar gateway. It's uh, three meters. Um, if you were to embrace, let's say a little bit different thinking and use a Skylab type approach, take the propellant tank out of the space launch system and fly it. It's already designed to take the launch loads. It's designed for 40 PSI. It will take the pressure loads with ample margin and it gives you 8.4 meters in diameter. And that's a square function across there, going from 3 to 8.4. That's what you want. I think that's the direction that we need to go rather than smaller than an ISS module, go larger. In some of the earlier studies, when we looked at that, you could launch it fully integrated with groceries for three crew for 180 days and, uh, you know, have it out in cislunar space. So uh, it's a, a different approach than what we have for ISS but in many ways, thank goodness.
Um, there are plans that show how this is laid out. And again, this is different. Uh, typically, um, you would do a, what's called a bologna slice type floor configuration. And that's how this started. But it's different because it's very hard to lay out a circular floor plan. And typically you'll have one or two uh, circulation tubes up through uh, habitat of this diameter. And then you've got to be able to get the crew to those places. So we looked at uh, having a horizontal configuration. And then in the end domes, which are compound curves, is where the crew actually goes from deck to deck. So it works very well in terms of a plan. And uh, the other benefit, by being so large, we get passive radiation protection by having the crew quarters in the middle. And all of the mass of the elements around that give us some. And if we need more, we can put in water, polyethylene, uh, to provide additional protection for uh, SPE radiation protection. That is my presentation. Excellent. Um, and now we are looking uh, deeper into what um, you know, space architects do in terms of physical um, physical structures. And uh, 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 you're so right, uh, Brand. Uh, Paul Hudson uh, is, a, is a very special, very uh, talented uh, uh, artwork by Paul. Uh, do you keep in touch with him? I just recently have, and uh, <laughs> he is uh, a product of uh, the incredible capability that we have now in terms of visualization through computers. But uh, he burned out uh, like many of the other space artists. Um, but he brought to the game the highest thing. I mean, um, I worked with him for about 10 years and pretty much after hours. And he just had a penchant for detail. He wanted it to be right. And if it took one hair on the brush and two months, that's what it took. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Brand. It's a beautiful presentation. Anybody else for one question before we move on? We'll, we'll, we'll have discussions uh, at, during panel time. Thank you, Brand. Uh, who's next? You're welcome. Hey, um, this is Chris Kennedy. I believe I'm next. Can Go you for hear it, Chris. me? Okay. Um, I can hear you well, but we can't see your screen yet. Yes, of course. I will share it. Oh, excuse me. Right. Can you see the screen now? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. I there cannot on my end. Oh, there we go. It's coming up. Hey. Perfect. Got it. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, having me today. I am thrilled to be a part of this um, and great. I'm so happy to see so many six alumni. I too am a uh, six alumni from uh, 1988. And um, with that, uh, let me proceed. So um, I've been a licensed architect in Texas for since about 1995 and involved, involved in space architecture since 86. Um, the title of Space Architect certainly seems to get a lot of play these days in recent times. Uh, just a friendly reminder that NCARB and the bylaws require an architect license to call yourself an architect. So uh, please keep that in mind as you move forward. I would hate to see anybody get any trouble on that. Um, as we move forward in our uh, push for uh, exploration and settlement, there are many different destinations to think about. And as we think about those destinations, we need to think about sustained human presence and Earth independence. And that means many things to many people. Um, and each of our destinations, including remote Earth destinations um, for human exploration, will uh, employ these kinds of uh, philosophies and efforts to make sure that the humans are safe and uh, survive, can um, be uh, thrive and prosperous. Um, Please consider the types of human exploration operations. In other words, consider the users, uh, how these humans and human related uh, experiences and what they're doing there from, uh, you know, crew operations, IBA and crew operations external, EBA. Um, consider the mission operations, what they're doing, how, what's the purpose of the mission, the objectives and that, you know, the test objectives of it. 
And then always include science. I've been a part of uh, a number of, I believe I skipped a slide, but anyways, um, I've been a part of a number of uh, projects at NASA because I worked at NASA for 30 years. Um, and some of them would say, uh, even recent ones like Gateway, well, we're not gonna do science. Well, the reality is, yes, you are. We're gonna do science wherever we go and what we do because we are learning from those activities. We are learning from those uh, exploration activities and, and living and working in those destinations. Um, another important part of the operations is consider the logistics and maintenance operations, both external and internal to your facilities. This is so extremely important as uh, several of the speakers have pointed out already, pertaining to um, you know, just the clutter of, of uh, supplies and spares and being able to find them, being able to track them and know what you have there. And there are a lot of uh, technologies being worked on which is gonna help that and enable that. Um, also consider when you're doing this, um, especially for planetary uh, facilities or planetary bases, consider the uh, base organization, zoning and site infrastructure. Uh, much like here on Earth, um, as we begin to define or develop a um, facility or a capability in a, like a town or a city or, you know, even just a master planning community, we really need to think about those zoning and the site infrastructure and how to uh, allow that initial habitation capability to grow into, um, you know, permanent settlement. And that's really important. So please consider that. Um, this is some of the things that we teach at SIXA and try to get our students to understand the big picture and understand the end state. You know, it's not just about the initial landing, um, the initial uh, lander or first exploration, but really understanding where are you going, what's the end state that we're trying to achieve. One of the things that um, I have uh, worked on over the years is understanding space habitation classifications. And, um, you know, we've talked about and you've seen some stuff already about uh, what I consider the class one pre-integrated habitat module, kind of a space station derivative. And that is really kind of heavily uh, aerospace engineered. Um, the architects have a role there, but it's not quite as evident as, as you begin to move into a class two, which is a prefabricated deployable, like an inflatable uh, transhab or something like that. Um, you see that there will be more of a architectural presence, uh, both in the uh, design of the overall structure, but also the internal architecture. Um, and then as we move, uh, both in evolution of time and technology, we begin to uh, move into the time or f the space habitats of a class three, which is in situ derived. Here's where I believe this is the tipping point for space architecture where we are truly going to um, begin to see more space architects and, and that type of uh, profession becoming more and more prominent into the plans of the development of uh, surface systems and the moon and Mars. And you can see the uh, key characteristics that um, we have identified over time for these three classifications. <clears throat> so, my whole uh, aspect of this is a, to introduce to you a value proposition that space architecture is indeed at the tipping point. Um, architecture and humans have evolved together. From the very early days of human, uh, architecture was basically human shelter. It was caves, it was um, the uh, settlements and begin to build into caves or into side of cliffs and then became more of nomadic architecture. And then as we evolved as humans, the architecture evolved alongside us. And now we have these uh, complex uh, cities and so on, and the humans uh, actually have evolved too alongside that. And what I see is coming in this tipping point is a uh, space architecture convergence, if you will. Um, you know, if you think about space station and its microgravity aspects, it's really a lot about survival and the research that's going on there to enable us to go on and do more. Um, so the class three aspects of in situ space habitation 
is that tipping point where architects will take a stronger, more important role in the evolution of humanity. And, you know, this will enable us or humans to become a multi-planet species. Um, I believe that planetary habitats being partial gravity gives us an opportunity to challenge the traditional space station kind of systems and so on. And as it was mentioned earlier, the psychology of the internal architecture is so important to enable humans to live long term in these isolated and confined spaces. Um, the aspect of biophilia, bringing nature with us is important. Nature is a part of our human DNA and, is, and so we need to bring that with us and bring in uh, bio-inspired technologies. We need to address the nine human needs and we need to be aware of the human senses as they live in these facilities. So I just wanted to show examples of a class one. This is one that I worked on with Scott Howe and many others. Um, this is a pressurized excursion module, really it is uh, about the idea of development and using a um, capability to create a mobile uh, architecture, if you will. Uh, during the Constellation Architecture team, we designed this around 2008-2009. Uh, this is an example of a class two, um, the ISS Transhab, an inflatable habitat. Um, this one was a good example of a prefabricated deployable architecture that I was involved with in 1999-2000 uh, timeframe. And then this is an example of a class three uh, lunar lava tube tower facility that I'm currently working on with the United Space Structures. And our vision there is to provide habitation cap capabilities that enable a space commerce to thrive in support of human exploration and resource consumption to become Earth independent while establishing permanent human presence on the moon and Mars. <clears throat> this is uh, a good example of what uh, I think uh, in situ kind of structures and there are many other examples and that's where I believe the space architects really will come to uh, like I said the tipping point come to uh, bear uh, good fruit on the development of space. Um, this is kind of a cutaway of that showing the la uh, tower facility inside of a lava tube the notional concept of that and then how it might be divided up creating bulkheads um, different segments for different capabilities and different functions. And um, it is scalable in size and, and uh, scalable in both diameter and height, depending on the uh, lava tube. Um, it is a unique concept. Um, I will say this much, it, it, you know, it really is pulling on this whole ISRU derived structures. It's about permanent settlement and earth independence and self-sustaining. Yes, it is bold, it's aggressive, but it's also a forcing function, forcing function to, to get the capabilities and systems needed that we would need to uh, purchase or uh, get from our vendors. And it's also a paradigm shift. It's about permanent settlement. It's not about flags and footprints. This is about going there to stay. And it promotes the aspect of an end state. This is where we want to go. This is what we want to do. Um, so space architecture is really uh, uh, has transformed the old school aerospace uh, spacecraft designs and habitat designs. Think of the space station module and where we're going now to these class three designs which are incredible and, and, and quite a variety of them. Um, space architecture also emphasizes the aspect of human-centered design and integration. So with the, you know, with space architecture at a, oh, sorry. Space architecture is at that tipping point with the aspect of tremendous growth in space commerce. We're going to see that how this is moving space architecture to the forefront of design and development. Um, I feel that space architecture is in a renaissance of traditional architecture. It's a rebirth of the profession, um, really looking at providing human shelter protection and the physiological and psychological well-being. Um, as I mentioned before, architecture has evolved alongside humanity and space architecture is at that tipping point where it is going to enable us to become a multi-planet species. It's important to consider the psychology of the internal architecture to promote the human health and well-being and that also space architecture is at a paradigm shift in that um, partial gravity systems, we should be looking at uh, hybrid systems that 
are derived from Earth, derived hybrid systems, as well as the space system. So my challenge to you is the journey begins with an inspiration. So dare to dream, be inspired, and inspire others. We all need the desire, drive, and determination to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's so good to see uh, somebody push the agenda way forward to the third phase of design and uh, vision, uh, uh, thinking about uh, permanent settlements and particularly my favorite area, which is lava tubes. Uh, why are we not exploring lava tubes? It's still uh, stunning to me that we put other ideas uh, about uh, uh, space science uh, when we should be looking at something like this uh, up front and quickly. Good. Uh, we have uh, one question for uh, uh, Chris. Uh, anybody uh, uh, want to ask? Uh, I see one question here. Uh, uh, biophilia. Uh, everybody agrees. I think Andrew Walton wants to say uh, biophilia and blue sky. Uh, brutalist feeling of regular. Yeah, well, he's just commenting. Good. Okay. Uh, uh, any. Um, shall we move on and then we question? have some. Okay. Okay, Barbara, one little question. Okay. No, I think I, I really liked how you, uh, you know, structured your presentation and what you presented. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, the, regarding the, the class three, or do you have any kind of timeline um, when you think um, you have to be ready uh, with the, the fully fledged class three uh, habitat you are currently looking at? Well, what, we we're, we want to push the envelope, if you will. We want to be a, a forcing function to push the class three habitats and certainly the idea of living in a lava tube. When that will happen will deter be determined by availability of funding to pursue those endeavors. However, as we've seen and we'll probably will see here in the presentations later on, um, there is a big push to really embrace the class three in situ derived structures and habitats on the moon and Mars, whether they be above ground or below ground. I think that is our tipping point. That is our, our um, evolution, if you will, away from these uh, confined small little space station cans. You know, the space station cans where they're great and they're very efficient are really an engineering aspect. It's not, it's not a, an architectural uh, premise there. So my value proposition is really that space architecture and ISIU kind of derived structures are lock and step and we will see that evolve. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, yeah. In the interest of time, we are moving along and we'll have more discussions on this matter during uh, the panel. Good. Go for it. Uh, who's next? Go for it, yeah, Scott. Is, okay, got it. Um, okay, uh, first of all, I just wanted to say uh, it's uh, so nice to be uh, talking with so many of my colleagues. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to work with everybody in the past and I hope we have uh, many more years uh, working together and uh, uh, doing interesting stuff. Uh, I'm excited about the younger generation coming up as well. Um, I, I'm going to talk ab about some things that are building upon uh, the, what the previous speakers have uh, given us. Um, first of all, you just saw this uh, diagram. This was uh, provided by Chris and then uh, also uh, Mark Cohen had some some involvement uh, with some of the inspiration in the, these early definition of classes. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, how we actually construct these types of, uh, of structures, or at least some of the efforts that we're doing right now to get to the point where we can actually uh, monitor and uh, manage the, the uh, material handling and the actual assembly of these types of things. Uh, my background, I uh, 
am also a licensed architect and I spent uh, until the age of 40, most of my career in Tokyo, uh, working with the Japanese on robotic construction, where uh, I worked on, uh, if you can see my cursor, the, uh, uh, let me see, the Kajima project, and then also a little bit with Obayashi and uh, Shimizu as well. Uh, the the current JPL robotic constructor is on the right, the lower right, and it's called Athlete, the all-terrain, hex-limbed, extraterrestrial explorer. And uh, essentially, it's a uh, six uh, six DOF robotic arms that have the ability to swap out tools. And one of those tools happens to be a wheel for mobility. Uh, so we, this is a, uh, an anim or a, uh, a speeded up uh, video of the uh, athlete system out at, uh, in Arizona at Black Point Lava Flow, where it's taking a, a habitat off the top of a flat top lander. As you recall, uh, Brand Griffin's discussion earlier, the uh, typical flat top lander has a lot of problems. And so we're trying to figure out how to actually get stuff off the top and put it on the surface. The case of athlete, it'll take the payload, put it on the surface, and then uh, break into two halves where two what we call triathletes break apart and they can go off and get another habitat and bring that to where the first one is to slowly build up pressurized environment. Uh, this is this was taken in uh, Moses Lake, Washington, uh, using a, a, a previous version of Athlete, um, and it was part of it was uh, being operated locally, part from uh, from uh, Texas. We lost you a little bit. Uh, can you uh, can you see what the problem is, uh, Scott? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it might be internet up here. So anyway, the uh, the other thing that we're trying to do is not only uh, take and assemble in the class two type structures where you have modules that you're putting together to create uh, uh, larger uh, conglomerations of modules to 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 have larger pressurized environment, but also using Athlete as a 3D printer, where you have a print head on the end of uh, the arm, and that is able to print out uh, tilt up beams or prefabricated mo models or, or modules for walls and things like that as well. And uh, you'll hear a little bit later. I think from Melody, who will talk about uh, some of the stuff that she has done. Um, we did uh, do some very simple tests. This is older video where we uh, took athlete and uh, uh, extruded uh, concrete using the athlete limb to make uh, streams of, uh, of extruded cement. Um, the uh, the work that Melody had done, of course, is to go beyond this and to create larger structures. Um, let me just go on from that. So basically what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to take the current uh, concepts that uh, Next Step has called out and Next Step has been using most of these, the modules that are listed here, uh, ISS type, uh, transhab slash Bigelow type, and then uh, the smaller uh, commercial type uh, Cygnus size modules. And how do we uh, uh, move these types of struct these modules around and uh, assemble them together into uh, outposts? Another type is the uh, the vertical horizontal uh, cylinder type, which uh, the HDU was. I have a few. Uh, pictures of that, which uh, Chris Kennedy and I worked together on. And then uh, other things like, for instance, Brand Griffin mentioned the Skylab 2, the dry prop tank derived 
uh, concept. There's also uh, mid, ex mid expandable and other types of modules that if we could uh, use these as our basic building blocks, then we can have robotic systems that can assemble those together. Um, just really quick, the habitat demonstration unit um, that uh, Chris and I worked on uh, out at the out in the desert used uh, a uh, the idea was in the lower left hand corner you could have athlete carry that off the lander and assemble that into place and slowly build up an app outpost uh, with with uh, those modules to increase the size of your your pressurized environment. Uh, these are just some uh, images of the inside of the uh, the lab deck, the airlock, the uh, inflatable loft, and some of the other uh, images, uh, uh, equipment, et cetera. So uh, uh, another recent project that, that we worked on um, is uh, totally came from a, a space architecture perspective. And that is where in the, uh, if you look at the lower right-hand corner, we started off with a design party. P-A-R-T-I. And a parti is, this is something that you don't usually see in systems engineering, but it is used all the time in architecture. And it's a simple diagram that uh, it uh, dictates how all the elements are going to work together. And with this parti, um, we've taken a lot of the previous work that's been done on surface uh, construction and uh, created a uh, system that, that is downloadable. These are just some images of, uh, this is a, looking at it from underneath where you have a shield tunnel and a series of modules laid on the, out on the surface. And we started off with a gantry straddler um, inspired by uh, Brent Sherwood's uh, Bo early Boeing work. And the, uh, the straddler will, uh, get itself delivered on a horizontal lander. And this is inspired by uh, the, the work that Brand Griffin showed us earlier, uh, where you have the, the payload close to the ground. Uh, the, uh, once you have the straddler on board, it, it, um, since the landing gear are not radially symmetric, uh, then you, you can have the uh, straddler um, unlock itself from the being delivered on the lander and um, move itself away off to the side. And then also later on, if you see in the lower uh, couple of images, you, that Strather can come back later, pick up modules and move those off to the side as well uh, for the placement on the surface. And you don't have the, some of the issues of a tall lander deck. Uh, so the step one would be the Strather comes down, you use you create foundations using ISRU as much as possible, printing or sandbags, et cetera. Number two, you install a uh, prefabricated deployable tunnel structure. Uh, number three is you uh, blow uh, regolith on it with a uh, kind of a snowblower approach or through excavation, et cetera. And then number four, later on, you can go ahead and move the modules inside and uh, there's enough clearance so that the straddler can continually maintain the, uh, mo the modules on the inside and still um, be able to move those in and out as needed. So uh, basically that's kind of uh, the end of, uh, or some of the research stuff that we did. Here's a, a selection of, of references uh, that I uh, referred to just now. Uh, any, any questions? Thank you, Scott, to going, going into details about uh, uh, space architecture. I liked your definition for party. Um, so, um, yeah, any questions for uh, Scott? Let's, uh, yeah, let's move on, um, Scott. Thank you for, us, for us, such a beautiful, uh, beautiful set of slides. Um, who is going next? Uh, do I think it's me? Oh, John, go for it. Okay, very good. One moment to pull up my slides. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I assume everyone can hear me. Madhu, system check. Yes. yes, it looks good. Okay, very good. So, uh, good afternoon. I, I, it's terrible that we're exactly on time. That means I'm obligated to stay on time. Uh, my talk today is going to be a little bit different, but uh, uh, describe some of the activities that are currently going on uh, uh, in the international community with regard to the Moon Village concept. Uh, in particular, uh, I wanted to just highlight the, the radical change of which we are all aware. This is the global history of uh, many, most of the missions that have occurred over the past 20 years. And as you can see, it's one or two missions every two or three years uh, since over the last 20 years. And then looking at the next five years, there's a positive swarm of, uh, of uh, probes, landers, orbiters, CubeSats, uh, sample returns, uh, leading to human missions, all going to the moon and going to the moon uh, predominantly, I believe, because of the um, increased technological capabilities internationally, as well as the uh, significant interest uh, by multiple countries uh, in the uh, resources of the moon that have been verified in the past decade. Uh, however, uh, in point of fact, this is not a settlement. Uh, the, the question that the uh, Moon Village, uh, our, the Moon Village Association uh, Architecture Working Group is looking at this year is the question of what is a lunar settlement in the year 2045? What could it be? And it, uh, as has been highlighted by a number of people, uh, uh, there are a wide variety of architectural options and issues for the moon. Uh, this is probably the single most typical uh, image, uh, the type of image that gets shown, um, which is just a, a space station type module, possibly with some inflatable elements um, in place and then buried beneath the lunar regolith. And this, of course, is not a settlement. Uh, the Moon Village um, Architecture Working Group is looking this year and next year at a series of um, options in an integrated uh, case study focusing on a lunar uh, settlement. We are beginning with a series of, of scenarios which basically have to do with the drivers for lunar activities. Scenario alpha is that uh, uh, lunar activities may be like the International Space Station driven by government human spaceflight programs. Scenario beta is science driven. Of what if the moon is like uh, Antarctica, a place where science bases are put into place? And scenario gamma is what if the moon is like uh, the, uh, the, the uh, a commercial development scenario where uh, uh, private sector players uh, are significant drivers in activities. Uh, of course, the real future won't be any one of these, but some combination. And the question is, how do you integrate the uh, plans and activities in order to get a better handle on what that integrated prospective future might be? We've defined a set of architectural element categories. Uh, we are um, uh, using those to frame uh, a case study and from that a set of building blocks that we believe are going to be critical to realizing a lunar settlement, a moon village settlement in the future. Now, of course, uh, uh, you can't be fully generic in, uh, in anything like this. The way that we've approached uh, coming to terms with uh, narrowing down on a case study for this year and next uh, is by looking at the important role of space transportation uh, in particular, in the last five years, since the first flight of the Falcon 9 reusable, the cost of commercial access to low Earth orbit uh, has been dramatically reduced uh, to something like $2,500 per kilogram. This is a significant reduction over what is possible with government systems. Uh, and we believe that uh, with the uh, future advent of the new Glenn, uh, and prospectively the Starship uh, and then vehicles that will follow, that there will be systemic reductions, perhaps down to about $1,000 a kilogram to low Earth orbit 
during the coming several years. So um, the assumption in this case study is that that drastic further reduction in access to space uh, will occur before the year 2030. And because of the lower cost access to space, the cost of access to the lunar surface will similarly be dramatically reduced. What happens as a result? Well, we're already seeing the explosion in global connectivity from space. As a consequence, uh, uh, SpaceX is already deploying Starlink. That's some 4,400 satellites, each one several kilowatts of power, megawatts of power being fabricated. Uh, let's see, uh, 60 satellites went up uh, just uh, on the 18th, a couple of days ago. They represent um, more power in one launch, more solar energy in one launch than exists on the International Space Station. That kind of production is going to lead to affordable megawatt power systems in cislunar space now. So it's not, a, it's not a question of the distant future. These systems are being deployed, megawatts of solar power deployed in space because of the lower cost of space access, and it's happening right now. As a consequence, the development of the physical resources of space, beginning with the moon, are not in the view of the architecture working group of the Moon Village Association, a distant prospect Rather, with affordable megawatt class power, the utilization of the moon's resources for things like um, um, propellants production, uh, in situ fabrication of structural systems, all of those things will become possible in the nearer term rather than the farther term. And as a consequence, the sustainable permanent, uh, permanent human presence in cislunar space becomes vastly cheaper to accomplish. So this is the case study that we're looking at. It has a series of zones. Uh, the Moon Village as a concept is not limited to a single um, site. Uh, it includes the lunar surface, uh, multiple sites. In particular, uh, we're focusing on what we call zone one, the often illuminated uh, locations at the South Pole of the Moon. Uh, in particular, we're looking at the South Polar Lunar Ridge. Um, we're also looking at uh, permanently shadowed regions where there are ice and we believe potentially other volatiles deposited. Uh, zone three, uh, the uh, uh, far side of the moon, but in particular looking at the idea of lunar surface uh, science observat and science laboratories and observatories, and zone four, five, and six as illustrated. Uh, this is just a summary of the uh, concept of the moon village lunar settlement in the year 2045. That's our focal point. So we're looking at the at what could be true by 25 years from today, then looking backwards towards today and looking forwards towards the rest of the century. And if our assumptions are correct about the cost of um, launch, cost of transportation to the lunar surface, and the availability of megawatts of power at an affordable price, we believe that a first permanent human settlement on the moon is feasible within 25 years. Uh, we've identified through the study a series of building blocks. Um, uh, this just, this uh, chart just summarizes those in utilities and transportation and logistics, operations related human uh, operations and health and so on. Um, and this is our overall study plan forward. Uh, we've got a series of ongoing activities, preliminary studies and modeling right now. Uh, we're going to be presenting uh, pr uh, results uh, both in a working meeting in uh, September uh, at a Moon Village Association online September uh, symposium in November at the uh, International Astronautical Congress online event in October. Uh, we're having a workshop uh, for the architecture working group in December and then next year, ongoing studies and activities leading to a final report on the project by next fall. Uh, we would uh, welcome any participation by the many folks on this uh, Zoom uh, meeting uh, who are uh, interested. Uh, we're really cheap as an organization to join. Uh, so if you'd like to become part of the architecture working group and participate, in the definition of a settlement on the moon that could be realized by 2045. Please uh, come to moonvillageassociation.org and join us. Thank you very much.
Th thank you, uh, John, um, uh, to, um, to furnish us with real things that are happening. And that's important. And that's important for um, not only space architects and planners, uh, but for the public to know um, that that real things are happening. And I like the way uh, you put up uh, the uh, idea of the, of the power uh, and that uh, that is being generated uh, and being used uh, in Leo, uh, which is the next place of action. Uh, a question for John. Anybody else want to ask a question uh, for John? John, I also thought uh, uh, it's wonderful the way you've organized uh, the various meetings. And uh, uh, I know that we have one coming up at USC in December. And I uh, hope uh, that works very well. September, you know, all of September. You need to, yes. Uh, all of you need to know that uh, uh, the Moon Village Association uh, has done some fascinating work uh, that seems to be reflected in the policy, uh, 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 you know, the uh, Artemis um, the work and the accord and so on. And, and I'm very glad to see that kind of international um, you know, feed uh, into uh, our uh, national program. And I hope it works both ways, John. And uh, we'll be uh, talking about it more in the panel. Uh, a question for John. Uh, uh, let me see. The time, the, the time frame seems really aggressive. Yeah, and, and that's fair enough. But I'll just, I'll just highlight again that the first launch of a Falcon 9 reusable was in 2015. And, the, uh, and uh, uh, this past week, this uh, launch on Wednesday was the sixth launch of one of the Falcon 9 uh, vehicles. Uh, and it was used to launch more solar power in a, in a, a, a kit of 60 Starlink satellites than exists on the International Space Station. So some uh, 600 of those satellites have been fabricated in the last 24 months, uh, representing 10 times more power than the International Space Station. And so, yeah, I agree it's an aggressive schedule, but my feeling is that with transportation and power in the bag, that the 25 years could prove to be a really long expectation for how quickly the resources of the moon could actually be uh, effectively developed and utilized. Uh, whether or not we get there with regard to, you know, the permanent human presence, there are of course outstanding science issues, uh, but in terms of the industrial considerations, uh, I, I think uh, there's nothing to stop them except uh, uh, policy changes. Um, yeah, John, uh, John is being polite and kind. Um, I think it is not aggressive. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think the timeline uh, is pretty pretty straightforward. The main thing I believe that we are missing, um, uh, you know, watching rather and being sensitive to, uh, is the fact that the private sector is indeed taking charge. And I think uh, this may come as a surprise to some people in the government agencies, but uh, uh, this is true. Uh, as John clearly mentioned, uh, um, launch costs have plummeted, and so has various other aspects of robotics, John, and, uh, yeah. and, and uh, calm, calm structures with you know, communication networks, something we never pay attention to but my professor taught me uh, 30 years ago that loss of link equal to loss of mission. So everybody comes to the comm engineer at some point or the other. Okay, any other questions for John before we uh, uh, go to the next uh, uh, speaker? There are okay. questions in the Q&A, but maybe John, you can answer it's typing it directly or something like what we kept doing. But uh, I have many questions, okay, but we we'll, talk we'll do that. <laughs> we'll do that in the Q and A. Did I see another hand come up briefly? Uh, uh, okay, that's good. All right. Um, so who's going next? I think it's my turn next. That's Would right, Barbara. Go for it. 
Yeah, I've been. I remember I've been in the um, inauguration um, meeting of the um, Moon Village. Of the Moon Village, yeah, yeah. in Paris, or yeah, but when the idea was created, that was a couple of years ago. Not too many, and the association has grown into a really impressive um, network uh, with doing good work, important work. So, I'm I'm a member, of course. Um, okay, let me see how I can. Uh, do do we see anybody else online from the Moon Village Association, John? Uh, um. oh, it, it's hard. It's hard to tell. There's 103 folks online. <laughs> oh, 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 that's right. <laughs> okay, can you see my presentation? In yes, we can. Yes, we can, Barbara. Please go ahead. Okay, good. Well, um, good evening to everybody uh, who is uh, joining. Um, and I'm saying good evening because I'm here in Vienna, Austria. So at the other side of the ocean. Thanks very much for the invitation. And I'm, I'm really happy to join this gathering. Madhu, it uh, was a great idea to, to organize this with the AIA. You're welcome, Madhu. I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about um, Liquifer's uh, project. And uh, first of all, also about um, el different elements um, uh, and how to create um, a moon and a Mars space. Um, the main I would say um, categories of elements are uh, stationary elements, mobile elements, and EVA systems. And I think uh, Chris um, had shown um, all the complexities of how these are interconnected. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, Eden ISS, a greenhouse producing food, which is really essential for a sustainable base, the she modular uh, habitat. Um, we also were conducting um, a concept study, an extensive concept study for ESA, the European Space Agency, for a pressurized rover. And um, we were also at, in, in developing um, a ro robotic uh, exploration means to um, traversability of uh, foreign terrain. And um, recently, or in the last years, we also started developing prototypes for sampling systems uh, during EVAs. Um, in the 15 years of Liquifer's existence, we did a lot of simulator studies, so design studies of various types. And, in, and more recently, in the last, I would say, five or uh, six years, we also focused on ISRU, and uh, Chris was making an important point here that this is essential, and um, mainly 3D printing but we also look at nature for inspiration and look at um, biomimetics. Um, Madhu, you asked me to uh, also talk a little bit about the Eden ISS project. Yes, I uh, did. The greenhouse uh, for Moon and Mars, but it was, or it is still a part of the German Neumeyer 3 station in Antarctica. And um, it was a 14 partner project, an EU um, framework project. And um, we designed as architects the, um, the service section and um, the airlock module, which is when you see my cursor, which is on that side. But with our engineers in-house, we were also um, helping the, the whole team uh, to document on um, the requirements and the, the interfaces. On the videos here, the top uh, left corner, you see how uh, the, the vegetables are growing. There were uh, at least 10 types of uh, different vegetables. They were all grown in an aeroponic system where only every 10 minutes they were sprayed with a nutrition solution comprising water, uh, salt and potassium. And here you see um, the engineer of the German Aerospace Center, Paul Zabel, who spent nine months in, in Antarctica and producing um, on 10 square meters more than 300 kilos of vegetables. And in the background, you can see the uh, uh, glimpse of the service section and then the airlock, which we um, were designing. The Eden ISS greenhouse is really a step towards future exploration but it also serves as a good uh, facility to probe um, terrestrial um, growth or terrestrial um, growth chambers for vegetables in remote areas or in, in, high, in very dense areas. 
Another project was the, the Xi habitat. Um, as if, if we look at the map of the, of the elements uh, as a stationary element, it was um, a six partner project. One of the partners was Andre Duhl, also um, a space architect, well-known space architect. She stands for Self-Deployable Habitat for Extreme Environments. And it was really meant as a test facility built for Earth to test uh, missions, uh, future moon or Mars missions for two people and with a mission duration of two weeks or as an Antarctic um, um, test uh, research station or uh, when, when you look for um, as a high tech unit for disaster relief. So we in most of the projects we have, we do their components of terrestrial, extraterrestrial uh, similarities or um, or uh, things which you know where you can't where you can apply to to any kind of environment. So here you can see how she can be transported uh, either on a truck to different simulation sites, but also the way it's designed is really so two can fit into a larger rocket. That as I say, when it's deployed, it has a um, diameter of six meters. And here you can see the work area and the hygiene facility. Everything is deployable. And uh, we were also looking at uh, specific lighting systems at some interior which, which reduce the, the noise of the machines. Um, and also where, for example, the hygiene facility at the same time become, can also become a small workshop. And here is one of the crew quarters. They have virtual windows with different kinds of displays and um, also different colors, which we think is important in different um, surface materials. In the middle, there is a galley. We managed to uh, integrate Xi in the project Moonwalk to test it in Rio Tinto, a Martian analog. For, um, and we tested human robot cooperation technologies and Xi was the mission habitat for the, for the, Martian, for the Mars simulation. Moonwalk is another EU project um, with seven partners. And here there, you can see a little bit the different scenarios we tested where a small rover can help an astronaut explore unknown terrain or unsafe terrain for astronauts to go. And this also provided us, the Liquifer team, with a possibility to become simulation astronauts and really look at a different perspective uh, when we design um, systems, EVA systems in that case, but also habitats. You look understand. good in it. You look good in it, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the last project I'd like to present is really uh, going towards lunar exploration, which was the topic of most of the presentations of Brand, Chris and Mark and Scott. And um, it was, it's called Regolite and it's about solar centering um, regolith, lunar regolith only through the means of sunlight, which is there in abundance on the moon. And we are using this to, um, to center um, three dimensional interlocking elements uh, where we design, of which we design the geometries or also for surface battlement stabilizing elements for shelters, for envelopes, for habitats and um, or machinery shelters but it can be also used to prepare terrains for telescope on the far side of the moon or launch pad, launch pad or launch pad apron to uh, protect the, the, the launch site from the dust or no, the habitation area from the lunar dust. And um, of course we, are, uh, we, we think about the envelopes really for uh, protection of radiation and for, against radiation and micrometeoroids. And um, um, I think uh, Scott showed a really interesting concept where also inside and also branded where inside there are the pressurized volumes. So it gives you an, an, a space in between also to operate and maintain and repair. And these, you saw these three dimensional interlocking elements. Um, they were designed uh, according to these tests to three printing campaigns, which we conducted with the engineers and the scientists of the German Aerospace Center. You see on the top right um, the tests for the ambient environment with a movable uh, printer a table. On the bottom there is the table 
the whole, um, no, the, the Fresnel lens the, to concentrate the solar beam moves. And you can imagine that in further developments, the whole aperture can be put on wheels. So it becomes a mobile printer element. And to achieve um, a TRL technology, technology readiness level of six, we also um, put it into a vacuum chamber, which was, um, I said near because it wasn't that successful. So this technology really has to be a little bit further developed, developed to be able to assess uh, the viability. Um, and this is a printed um, element um, that is um, um, test geometry. It's not the, the final geometries because we had a lot of iterations with the engineers with each printing test. And I'd like to conclude with the first step towards lunar exploration. This is Gateway. And this is, um, a, we were designing the interior uh, for the uh, habitation, the international habitation module. This is the, our concept for Airbus. Currently, we are um, designing this with uh, Thales Alinea space. And um, you can see that the, the international habitation module, it, how a gateway will look like. Brand showed, um, I think, a more real, more recent configuration. So this is only is already a larger configuration, but um, basically it's very small and it's really about um, creating habitability and a, a space for living well under uh, very extreme circumstances. Not because of not only because of the environment, but also because of the type small volume. And I'd like to, uh, to conclude my presentation. I'd like to acknowledge um, my partners, uh, René Vaslavicek and Waltraud Hohenieder. But I'd also like to say that we are working with engineers in the team, Bob Davenport, Chris Gilbert, Stephen Ransom, but also other architects who support us on a couple of projects or specifically on the projects I showed here, um, Molly Hogel, Damian Minowski, Monika Lipinska, and I'd also like to acknowledge Smita Mohanty as the co-founder of Local for Systems Group. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. We, we want all of those people to come and talk um, uh, in our next uh, Space Architect gathering. Uh, my special, uh, uh, um, please convey my regard to Susmita Mohanty, uh, whom I've known for so long. She's wonderful and doing some exceptional work in India. And uh, uh, I want to thank you for a nice talk. Uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Our community is so small, Barbara. When you mentioned uh, TRL levels, guess who was listening? John Mankins is listening to you. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? And, and uh, uh, you know, I found uh, your, uh, your whole uh, uh, idea of, um, of designing spaces so important, exactly, you know, similar to what Anastasia told us. And, you know, that is, um, we have to be able to use these not only for space, but for people on Earth. And the time is coming, uh, you know, when you see these uh, kinds of structures already happening, perhaps in uh, airports in Japan, uh, you see uh, people in very congested spaces requiring uh, some relief from, uh, uh, from the action and the bustle of uh, daily life. But anyhow, uh, please, any other questions for uh, Barbara? We got uh, exactly one minute to do that. Okay, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be forced to ask you one more. <laughs> uh, now, um, how do you spend your time? Um, you know, I know that you are on the IRSU faculty as well. Um, how do you spend your time between practice and, uh, uh, and uh, teaching, uh, Barbara? <laughs> between, the time between is very limited. No, I think what I think, what I think is that, um, that it's a good combination because um, it's, um, it's very good to work um, with uh, people who are getting into that field um, and to share knowledge um, with them and at the same time also get input um, from them, from the whole experience. Um, and, um, and then of course the, um, the, real, the real projects, they are sometimes 
quite far away from the from the dreams and the hopes one has um, um, you know as a student but I think um, through this I'm able to to still you know have these dreams and to combine um, both parts when you know the the everyday work sometimes becomes very um, how can I say very pragmatic not monotonous but that's good to see um, um, you know I asked you only because you post some uh, cool pictures on your Instagram site uh, but that's good Okay, uh, so we are ready to go on to our next speaker. Um, and, uh, I'm, uh, and that would be uh, uh, Barbara? Yes, <laughs> another Barbara. Hi guys. <laughs> Let's go for it. Hello, okay. Uh, let me share my screen uh, first. Thank you, okay. I'm gonna I hope all of you notice that we are slowly moving from uh, low Earth orbit onto the moon and now there is some reality is set in and uh, preparations for what to do before we get to the moon. Go for it. Exactly. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. I'm very happy. I'm a huge fan of, you know, all of you guys in this group. Uh, I've been very fortunate to talk to, to many of you on private meetings. And uh, want to share your slides. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Let me share my slide. Okay, let's go. Alors. Okay. So. Interstellar. I don't know how much you guys know about us, so, um, so I'm going to introduce ourselves very quickly. So Interstellar, it's a, we're a startup. We're a very a young company, um, a year and a half old. And I, a company is based between Los Angeles and Paris. Most of the team is in Paris. A third of the team is in Los Angeles, and we're growing the team in LA right now. So the problems we're trying to solve, it's a double problem. So um, I do you've been talking about problems we have, we're facing right, right now on Earth uh, regarding, you know, climate change. And this is not only the human thoughts and, and, and there is like this entire cycle of the planet and the solar system and what's going on. But there is one thing that human can do in the coming years is to help the transition to regenerative solution. Regenerative solution are solution where basically there is no waste. So where everything is integrated from the food production system to the waste management system to the water treatment system. And, and to build this type of solution right now, most of the people are focusing on very um, a, a specific solution for each problem. And nobody has really a, a complete holistic, holistic approach uh, with the, taking a little bit of you know, perspective and trying to build an integrated system. But there is a huge need that we, we transition on earth right now to the solution. And at the same time, this is what is very interesting is that we have 10 to 15 years to test a different system before we go to Mars. I'm talking more about Mars, but we're also very uh, keen on going back to the moon and, and, and building a base on the moon. Uh, but it, it's true, the, the company was funded basically on the principle of becoming a multiplanetary species. The moon is not a planet, but we believe the moon is a, is a you know, this is the way to go before we go to Mars. You can um, always you can always use the term Mars forward plans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, so there is a huge need right now to test on Earth regenerative life support solution. And what is very interesting is that a closed a close loop life support system, you need to produce the food to recycle the waste, to recycle the water and everything, you know, you know completely self-sustaining system. So there is a strong parallel between the system you need to implement right now on Earth and those that we need to in space in the future. So that's what we're trying to do um, at Interstellar. It's basically to help the transition to regenerative solution on Earth and at the same time preparing for future sustainable settlement on Mars and the moon, I should have changed my <laughs> slides. So the solution, so yeah, most of you have seen those images. Uh, we, we showed them for the first time last year. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have new ones, but we're gonna sh show new ones uh, in October. Uh, so I'm very, uh, uh, I, I take my time when we, we share new uh, iteration on the design. But so basically what we're working on is called the bio. So it's exp experimental bio station. It's a, it, those are modular and closed loop villages. I'll explain a little bit more environmentally controlled and completely sealed. So it means that the air you're breathing inside the station, the food you're eating inside the station and the water you're drinking inside the station is coming from the station. So it, there is no open supply approach. Um, and it's completely controlled with different compartments and I'll explain a little bit more after. Uh, it's designed as a closed ecological system. So what it means, it means that prior to designing all the architectural plan or, or the mechanics, all the hardware, we need to build a scientific model 
with a lot of stoichiometric equation to understand how the chemical, uh, how, how the, what is going to be the molecular behavior inside the station. So we needed to simulate how plants will behave, how humans will behave, how much CO2, O2 water we will need, how much waste we're going to get, and how can we recycle it. So we had to develop this entire you know, a, a scientific model, which we turn into algorithm, and, and I'll show you the simulation after, to be able to design the station. And the station is for us a framework for sustainable living on Earth, uh, and it's also a test bed for space settlement on Mars and the Moon. Uh, so it's a modular station. What, it, what I mean by modular is that we are plugging, we we adding different modules one to each other. Um, so when it comes to building a village, so the plan is to build 10 village in the 10 coming years on Earth before we go anywhere else. Each village is a combination of module. One module is designed to support life for a group of five people. Uh, it's, uh, it's, as I said before, it has very high, uh, so closure for air, water, and food. Uh, it's designed to fulfill the physiological need, so basically air, water, and food, but also the psychological needs. And that's why we're paying so much attention in putting a lot of plants and uh, ecological system inside the station. And unfortunately, uh, during this very tough time that we're living right now with the confinement and the COVID crisis, there have been some, some interesting uh, um, thing that came out uh, for us. There was this huge trend. I don't know if it happened in California. I'm, I'm in Paris right now. Uh, so Paris is a city, um, everybody was stuck at home. Um, and what happened is that a lot of people actually bought plants. Even myself, I turned my living room almost look like a jungle and I grow a lot of plants. And there is this very important feeling that humans need to be connected with nature. For, for us, that designing a space settlement on another planet and uh, on Mars or on the moon will require us to bring plants and so a biological system. So the way we see the future of space settlement is by combining biological system with physical chemical solution. Biological system are not ready right now to rely on 100%. So you need to combine it with physical chemical, but we strongly believe that there is a huge need to build greenhouses, no matter where humans are going. Maybe a hundred years from now will be robots with only you know AI chips in our heads, but that's not the case now. <laughs> and so the station is also designed to preserve biodiversity and biological ecosystem. Uh, one of our very strong criteria in our crop selection uh, is actually a huge, a very high level of crop diversity. Um, for, for, for many reasons, but also because we are, so we are producing the food, so it's a, uh, it's a vegan diet when you live inside the station, we are producing the foods, and, and if you keep on eating always the same thing all the time, you know, psychologically you don't feel well, um, and so it's, and, and also to reach all the nutritional requirements that you need, you need a very high diversity of crops over time, and especially when it comes to different vitamins and, and all this stuff. Uh, so the module, so each village is, is a combination of module, of a module. A module um, is, uh, uh, is organized with four domes. Uh, one dome is the habitat section. The design again is going to, so we've been doing a couple of iterations, but there is a, a more updated design that is going to come in a month and a half from now. Uh, it's going to look similar, but some, some tweaks. Um, so a habitat section, two, uh, two uh, control environment agriculture dome, one dedicated to aeroponic and another one dedicated to a subtropical greenhouse, and then another dome for the waste, uh, waste and water treatment system. Um, we, so, so we do everything internally. I'm not sharing here um, all the deep dive design, uh, but it's basically each dome is composed of a metallic structure, uh, a Voronex structure. And then on top of each dome, not the habitat, but the, the three other domes, on the aeroponics and the waste management, this is a tensile, um, a tensile membrane. And on the greenhouse dome, this is an inflatable membrane, uh, which is, which is uh, patented, uh, which, which has a very high uh, light uh, transmittance capability, a very high uh, thermal insulation capability. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll share more very, very soon. Um, so a little bit more about, uh, so about the module. 
So each module, so as I said, is designed to support life for uh, five people. It's completely sealed. Uh, of course, inside we have CO2 tanks, O2 tanks. Uh, we have a complete HVHC system. Um, uh, we recreating atmospheric condition inside. We have CO2 scrubbers. Uh, you, you can tell that the project is very inspired by Biosphere 2, uh, but we're not shy about saying that we're using uh, some technology here and, and, and we need CO2 scrubbers. Uh, maybe in the future we, we won't need them, but right now we're not ready to say that we can reach a, a closed system uh, without CO2 scrubbers. Um, so the aeroponic domes, we have a selection of 45 crops uh, that we divided into two categories. One is a cold, uh, uh, cold um, so we have two chambers inside the aeroponic. One is a cold chamber, the other one is a warm chamber. Uh, it's a high pressure aeroponic system that we're designing ourselves. So it's not a traditional horizontal one. It's a combination of A-frame horizontal and vertical because uh, we have a lot of different crops. Um, the greenhouse dome is the subtropical, uh, subtropical greenhouse. So we have each dome has its specific climate, temperature, and humidity level. Uh, the greenhouse is a soil-based greenhouse, but right now we're exploring making a combination of soil-based and some and some um, um, some other components just to reduce the size um, the size of the ground uh, where where we put the plants. Um, and then then what I wanted to say about yeah, with the dedicated water. Um, a water system, of course, optimized HVAC. And on this one, we don't have LED lights compared to the aeroponics dome. So on the greenhouse dome, we only rely on the light coming from the sun, uh, which is going to be an experiment. Um, but we're pretty confident the material we develop is going to help us. And, and first location are deserts, in desert location, desertic location with a lot of sun. So it should, should, should be, on the paper, it's working. <laughs> Let's see how it goes early next year. Uh, and the water and waste dome uh, is a combination of different technology, bioreactors, aerobic and aerobic systems. Um, we also developed our own biological water treatment system, but it's very, very, very low TRL, so it's like TRL two or three. So we need a couple of iteration to be able to put that in our system. So it will wait for to put our biological water treatment system maybe three, four years from now. Uh, the simulator. So I'm not sure I'm going to have the time to share the whole video. I'm going to maybe turn off the sound. But so basically, as I was explaining, for us, one part of building a simulation was to recreate um, um, a model that was going to simulate how the life's going to happen inside the station so we can follow the different variation of CO2, of O2, of temperature, and you, we will be able to understand all the flows so we can size accordingly the hardware. Because if you don't know the flow of water, if you don't know the flow of organic waste, how can you size the hardware and how can you design? So prior to do all the architectural work, we needed to do the scientific work, this calculation work. And so we used this to build a simulator. This simulator, we're gonna launch it at the end of, uh, at the end of uh, September. Maybe, if I can. It's three minutes. Um, I, I don't think I'm going to share everything, but let me to implement our turnkey with generative solution at home. I don't know if you hear the sound. Start by entering your requirements. Please help us provide a crop selection tailored to your needs. After filling in the number of people set to live in your station, you can choose to go with our preset parameters or customize your criteria. You can minimize surface area or water consumption, depending on your local constraints. You can select different levels of crop diversity or enter more advanced parameters. Greenhouse crops can be supplemented or replaced entirely with advanced aeroponics. You also get full control over the nutritional needs you want to cover. Finally, you can choose specific crops to add or remove from your diet. Our crop selection algorithm calculates the ideal combination of crops to fit your needs perfectly. On the result page, you will see which crop to grow in the station, where to plant them, and how each of them will help fulfill your nutritional needs. You can compare different selections with different requirements before launching a simulation. Once you chose a selection, you can run our simulator to see how your station will behave in time. The simulation algorithm predicts all the biochemical interactions inside the station. Congratulations, your simulation is ready. You can check the behavior of atmospheric parameters.
So I'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but, but basically the first part of the algorithm is just taking the requirements, the number of people you want to put and your, and your um, nutritional requirements to run a crop selection. So we build a, a very big database of crops. And then once the crops are selected, uh, basically you, you run the simulation and it puts a lot of data into our different algorithm that are simulating life inside the station. So what you can see now, it's basically inside the habitat, the different level, the O2, how it's going to behave over time. And you have this per different domes and that you can follow. I'm just going to, I'm just going to fast forward. And then basically when, so the, the plan, our plan is to have the first, okay, with COVID we are got a little bit delay, but it's going to be, early 2021. Uh, it was planned for later this year, but it's going to be early March 2021 um, in California. And then we connect the software basically to the station. So what the software is doing, it's allowing us to monitor the station in a very autonomous way. We're using the same prediction, the prediction from the prediction algorithm, and then we plugging it with the sensors inside the station and we are updating the data to see how it's behaving. Basically, then we can get red flags and we can understand a little bit more what's going on inside the station, level of CO2, level of O2, the food, the water, and what's going on. And so then it's connecting to the station. And sensors in the station that you built or the turnkey solution you chose to monitor it in real time. Congratulations. Your station is ready to go. And then the you have the dashboards. dashboards. Then you have the dashboards here that will allow you to follow in, in real time what's going on basically inside the station. And so, so it's um. So I'm go I'm just going to move to the to the next slide, if it's willing to move to the next slide. Yeah, I think I, I think I skip one slide. Okay, but, but, but basically, so in our approach to build an um, analog and a simulator on, on Earth, uh, we, to design the hardware and all the architectural parts, we had to uh, work on algorithm and we had to, to size the different system. And so we came up with a software, which is actually, which we're gonna be using to, for fully automation of the station. Um, and so, and hopefully we'll get enough data so we will be able to, you know, iterate more on the design and then to develop the different station on Earth and the future on the Moon and on Mars. Quick, uh, uh, quick, uh, quick information. Uh, uh, okay, the presentation is, is doing whatever it wants. Okay. No, we're uh, running over time, uh, Barbara. Okay. But, uh that's us. That's the team. So we're 15. Uh, so it's a combination of architects, engineers, software, biologists. A Walt Disney people, huge fan of Walt Disney. Uh, and we're hiring 15 people in LA. So we already have a lot of resume, but please uh, feel free to reach out if you're interested in joining our startup um, and to help build a future full of life on Earth and beyond. Voila. Merci, merci beaucoup, <laughs> uh, Mademoiselle. Uh, yes. It's good to see my student in your team. And that you yes. That. Yes. Okay. Thanks, we do. Take questions <laughs> later for Barbara, but we are ready to go to. Um, Oh, wonderful. Next presenter, John. Thank you, Madhu. And thank you, Ken, very much for putting this together. It's been a wonderful program, and it's great to get to know what everybody's up to. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit wild on some of the stuff I'm going to show you guys. So I want to show you some background first. But uh, so, Ken, can you go to the next slide? So what I've actually observed and I, I use all the time is I actually say I'm an outer space architect. And when you do that, people tend to go, what? Tell me more. And you basically get their attention. But I think uh, what's happening now, the year 20 to 29, is going to be an, an amazing year for the space industry. And I think our talents and capabilities are going to be needed more than ever before. And I'm aware of numerous projects coming up where your guys' design background, systems engineering is really, really going to be needed. So this is a great kind of seeing what's going on. Next. So for many years, uh, I've been involved in all this stuff, and I've always looked at a transition from traditional Earth architecture. You look at naval architecture, because we're always talking about ships, and then space architecture. So we're going to talk about space yachts and cruising in space. And if you ever look at the yachting industry, there's extraordinary design work and technology in this field we'll talk about later. Next. 
So this is my concept and design for a real orbital super yacht. Like I say, we'll explore that a little bit more. But I'm pretty confident this will get financed for a bunch of reasons. And my goal is to start the orbital super yacht industry and to get our very wealthy people and corporations to space to basically have the overview effect. Uh, next. Now my definition of design is pretty wide. It's real space architecture. It's earth-based like the analogs, you know, space theme parks, museums, and movies and games, TV shows. And I'm directly involved in all those areas. And I really think that basically comes down to being the space experience economy. And designers are critical to moving this forward in innovative ways. Next. I got involved in this in 1978. I was in my uh, fifth year of architecture school and the dean wanted to do a design studio designing a space colony. What's a space colony? Uh, so uh, we learned about High Frontier, Gerard O'Neill, and I had one of those moments as a young person realizing I could take my love and des for design and architecture and merge with my very strong interest in science and physics and astronomy and become an outer space architect. And I've been doing that ever since. Uh, next, I feel very fortunate. Okay, next please. We can go to the next slide. Yes. Yeah, sorry, just one, one second. Okay. So it really has been a pretty amazing career path and I've met some extraordinary people uh, during this whole thing. So I've been involved in projects that I've helped design that's flown in space, Space Hab, uh, been deployed underwater, the Aquarius Marine Lab. Uh, we deployed twice in Antarctic Science Space in Antarctica. Uh, that was pretty interesting. And then uh, cr designing spaceports. I spent time on Christmas Island, South Pacific, uh, which was a cool project. Next. Uh, Buzz Alden is one of my close friends. We worked together for almost 30 years. And uh, so Buzz is actually a very good designer himself. And as Madhu knows, he's full of ideas and has all kinds of great concepts. Oh, he's and, brimming with them. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, 90 years old, still got great concepts and things like that. So, um, yep. So there's Buzz and we've done a ton of stuff together. Next. Uh, so I got to work on the International Space Station, but it was about that. It was called the Freedom Space Station. Mark Cohen actually was our study director out of NASA Ames. And this was uh, in 85, 87. That was fascinating and a great introduction to some of the technologies and real world of space development. Next. I was involved in the formation of the Space Hab company and did the first designs of Space Hab and the first models. And, presentations and brought that all the way through when we got the first uh, $50 million and that really launched the whole company. And Space Hab flew uh, in uh, shuttles 18 times. Next. Uh, and I met Bob Bigelow in 1999 when he first got into the space area and I've been an advisor to him for the first three or four years of his involvement. We're still friends. Uh, but I got him very interested back then in inflatable architecture for space. And there's a whole long story about that. It was very fortuitous and worked out very well. So our next slides are coming up right away. Talking about inflatables, Chris is listening in. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Now I think Transhab was brilliant. Uh, and it was really great. And, oh, here's a good combination of real space and uh, movies and TV. So Jim Cameron in 2000 wanted to do a Mars movie and brought me in to help do planning for the vehicles and habitation and Mars uh, mission planning. I brought Buzz in. We spent about two years working with, Buzz, with Jim off and on. And uh, he shelved that movie for certain reasons. But later on, when he did Avatar, he used the uh, Mars transportation ship we had actually planned out, repurposed it for Avatar, for the, shev the ship that takes the Marine from uh, Earth over to, uh, to uh, Pandora. So that was actually pretty cool and fun. Next. Uh, for Analog, I've done a lot of work in this area. It's really important and really fun. A uh, good buddy of mine, business partner, owns 60 acres of land in the Barstow area on the way to Las Vegas. And we want to use that to create basically a whole series of analog facilities, uh, close to LA, close to the movie industry, all those kind of things. Uh, so, so this is a little on hold because a much larger project I'll talk about a little bit later. But really, this would be fun to actually have this uh, next. 
And uh, National Geographic came to me years ago. They wanted to do a TV series uh, called Mars Colony. Uh, so I planned out the whole thing and we designed this Mars Habitat next, which would have really been sets for the, for the TV show, but we would use it when we're not in production for tourists and overnight stays and that's how we pay for the whole thing. I'm always looking at how do you pay for and raise the money to do these innovative, cool projects because if you don't raise the money, you're not gonna get to do them. Next. Uh, and I pitched an idea to Pascal Lee, he's a good friend, you know, they have the, uh, their research facility up in Devon Island, but they can only use it for eight weeks of the year. So I said, let's build a high fidelity mock-up of the whole thing on my site in uh, Barstow and you can use it year round. You could train there and test the science. So when you deploy, you do better and more science there. And we have tourists come. Now the visitor center and overnight stays again, that's how we pay for it. Next. And this is a big, bigger picture of the Christmas Island. That was a really exciting project to spend several days on Christmas Island way in the South Pacific. Now they're not building this because the island's gonna mostly disappear with global warming and the sea rising, but it was still pretty fun. Next. And I was brought in to work on the zero gravity aircraft when that was first started. This was really fun too, because we really had huge logistics issues to deal with and how do you deal with sickness and all kinds of stuff. So it was beyond just the architecture in the operations. And I'm very interested in operations. Next. And this was my first big project. We actually got funding and built, got $200 million with Mitsubishi Corporation. I don't know why the lettering is wrong here, but uh, we built this in Japan. This is my concept and design for the world's first space theme park, Space World. We had a vertical space shuttle and uh, long story behind all this, but it was a fascinating experience to learn how the financial world works and to mix that up in real world architecture and design and got it built. Next. This is my big project right now, it's called Mars World. And uh, this is a proposed $2 billion mixed use entertainment complex for Las Vegas. This is a 66 acre site south of the airport. And this was designed for 7 million annual visitors. Next, please. And the concept is it's the city of the future on Mars. The core theme here is the future. The location happens to be exotic being Mars. But by having an exotic location and a future theme, it widens the entire range of the ability to tell stories and create shows and activities and all kinds of different things and to get major corporate sponsors for the whole thing. Uh, next, please. And this is one of the things we want to create in this very realistic Martian environment. And what we want to do with Mars World is connect the public to space exploration and settlement and to create the avenues where they can participate and be involved in no matter what their discipline or background is. Plus, you know, you make a lot of money doing these kind of things and we're gonna do real research at Mars World like Disney does at Epcot Center and develop another one in Orlando and one in Japan. Uh, next. So to, for all these invented worlds like the Harry Potter land or a Star Trek or a facility or Star Wars, Authenticity is the key to the success of the project. So I've been designing for years a real Mars city first and have been using that as the model for the Earth-based attraction and resort. And there, we'll spend tens of millions of dollars doing this as part of our backstory. Next. And we have a great location on Mars. There's a tourist spot. It's at the base of Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. Next. And from day one, I plan to build this city inside the rim of an impact crater because that's a, the people can be protected by the soil. It's a round circulation pattern. And for Earth, I want to have the dome, so which is round. So that all integrated very well together, architecturally and space-wise. Next. Uh, so we have a good architectural master plan. The dark part is actually the crater and would actually project on Mars building these facilities and all these landing areas and really create a whole detailed city master plan. Next. And this is basically a cross section through a, an impact crater. Uh, kind of interesting piece of architecture actually. But this is very well developed and we spent huge amounts of money and time putting this together. So we're pretty confident next year after all this virus stuff that we'll finance it and it should be up and operational in five years. Next. Medu's watched this whole thing going on for several years. Uh, real quick, going through, we've got to have, we want to have nukes on Mars. Nukes were mentioned earlier. 
It's got to have energy systems. People have to exercise in the low gravity, so turn that exercise into generating power. Next. We can go to the next one. Okay. Uh, you miss some, well, never mind. Um, anyway, there was a lot of information about, uh, oh, okay, let's stop here for a second. One thing, just so you guys know, I have a big bad thing about bulldozers in space. I can get a whole reason why I don't like bulldozers in space. So I came up with an alternative construction system, which is using these small uh, little devices that are connected together in swarms and run by an AI with little tools to dig and to move stuff and to build, weld and do all kinds of different kinds of things. You have to think about the future and how all these things go together. Next. Hydroponics, vertical farming, fish tanks. Next. And robots, 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 AI. These are all things needed to operate a city on the future on Mars. Next. And then you get into drones, rovers, exoskeletons, Mars suits. So there's tons of design and planning and science work to do to create the real Mars city plan and use that then for the Earth-based attraction resort. Next. We can go to next. Ah, back to the ships. So since the early 80s, I've modeled the space tourism industry after the cruise line industry. I'm the founder of the Space Tourism Society almost 25 years ago. And again, getting back to the yachts, uh, and the super yachts. So next, again, we all talk about spaceships and even a moon base is essentially gonna operate like a ship. It's an enclosed ship, there's a captain, there's a crew, all this kind of stuff. So Destiny is the orbital super yacht for about 10 passengers. Uh, the inflatable structures she used together, the sails collect solar energy and migrate to the charging stations. Next. And I wanted to create a beautiful spaceship because people want beautiful yachts, they're gonna want beautiful space yachts. Uh, next. And one of the big architectural features of this is a 60 foot diameter float sphere in the middle of the yacht. Just a big open space so you can fly and float and do all kinds of magical fun things. And remember, this is supposed to be fun. Next. Uh, now, this is great. Um, Ocean going super mega yachts, the hot tubs are a big deal. Now they even have swimming pools on board. How do you create a hot tub in zero gravity? This is the fun stuff in design. And here's a basically zero gravity hot tub. This would be very popular on the yacht. Next. But the core thing again is on your yacht, in your cabin, you're contemplating the earth and space. And again, hopefully really have a deep deep overview experience. And when these powerful, wealthy people return to Earth, uh, hopefully they'll have a better picture of doing good things for Earth. Next, almost done. Weddings in space can be very popular, although if you really look at it, I don't think this uh, lady should probably marry that guy, but that's a whole other story. Next. Oh, this is good. My movie producer friends have been pressuring me for years to put some time and energy in this. The idea of sports in space and lunar rover racing. There's billions of dollars in the sports industry, billions and more billions in the media industry, and they want the sexiest, newest, greatest thing to capture eyeballs. So when I pitch this, people say, we're in, we want to do this. I just don't have the time at the moment. But the great lunar rover race. Anybody who wants to team up on this, let me know. Uh, next. So to finish up, um, I deeply believe this. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. And one of the things I wish our space people would do, and I'm an advocate of this, is we are also futurist. We're futurists. If you think about it, we're talking 5, 10, 20 years, the future of humanity, moving out in the solar system. The futurist community is huge and has a lot of resources. The more we merge our space friends with our future friends, the more we'll empower ourselves to actually do so. And the, there's huge amounts of capital out there looking for good projects. And we're the people who create great ideas. So next. So this is the final slide. And this is my shameless promotion of our upcoming Space Tourism Conference. It'll be April 28, 2021. We're hoping to get 300 of our friends together in one place. Believe it or not, uh, 20th anniversary of Dennis Tito, first space uh, traveler flying into space. 25th anniversary of the uh, founding of the Space Tourism Society. And most of you guys know this, that's the Proud Bird Restaurant by LAX. 
that's where you're gonna hold it. So basically, we want to empower ourselves, come great concepts, we can get them built, and the more we work together, the better. And I think the future is very bright for creatives and designers, and especially outer space architects. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Thank you, John. We're going to move to the next one, but we'll have more discussion during panel. Thank you so much. Great, great set of slides. Okay, who's going next? Uh, I suppose Melody? That would be me. Oh, go for it. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Amazing. I apologize in advance. I have many slides, but I'm going to go quickly. Um, so my name is Melody. I'm a co-founder of Search Plus, which is short for Space Exploration Architecture. We are a small startup. Um, I like to refer to ourselves as an applied research group. And uh, our mission statement is to conceive, investigate, and produce innovative human-centered designs which enable human beings to not only live, but to thrive in space environments beyond Earth. I also do research in human factors and HCI and human capabilities for autonomous missions separate from search, but today we are speaking about space architecture. Um, these are searches habitation projects. We refer to it as search for short. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of these today, in particular the ones uh, that are 3D printed, and particularly the ones that are uh, winners of NASA Centennial Challenge. Um, our main goal and the main uh, thread that that connects all of these projects and and thematically what we strive for in the work that we do is to synthesize engineering constraints with human factors driven design innovation. So Search Plus founded as a direct outcome of winning uh, phase one of NASA's Centennial Challenge for a 3D printed habitat on Mars. The evolution of the challenge is an interesting one um, and it really did evolve over time and we were very fortunate to, ooh, to compete again in later stages, stages of the challenge, including phase three and one first place again for uh, the second final round of virtual design. We, uh, we also, uh, we competed with, uh, sorry, we collaborated with APIS Core on some of the construction levels. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. So um, Mars Ice House is the first prize winner of the phase one challenge of the 3D printed habitat competition and what it introduces is a uh, clear ETFB membrane that we propose that would be uh, precision manufactured on Earth, deployed on the surface of Mars, and then a 3D printed ice shell would be printed on the inside of that membrane. Why did we choose water ice as a building construction material? It's fairly unconventional approach to the way that uh, ISRU 3D printing might occur on the moon and Mars. Well, mainly we wanted to capitalize on the on the reality that water is a superior radiation shield for the astronauts over regolith or aluminum. And we were also interested in the potential of water ice being a translucent, um, I guess you could say barrier to the outside and enabling a, a, a stronger connection with the Martian landscape. So here you can see a section cutaway of the habitat itself. We have a vertically oriented lander with all of the mechanical systems that are pre-integrated and then a double ice shell 3D printed on the inside of this uh, ETFV membrane. And it introduces an interesting condition of an intermediate front yard, meaning a partially pressurized zone, uh, which is distinct from uh, the fully pressurized interior. Here's a view of the wardroom, which is the communal area at the very top of Mars Ice House, uh, we were speculating, and again, this is speculative, uh, that we could introduce vision windows within the 3D printed ice shell. And later we're able to validate that through some initial uh, material experiments that were done with NASA Langley. Here's a view of the exterior of Ice House. Um, and I really, I, I love this concept of a forcing function and how Architecture is really intended, Chris, the concept that Chris had brought up earlier of a forcing function. Um, this, is a, this is not a demonstrated technology by any means. None of what we were proposing in this, in this concept is tried and true. Um, it is really intended to push the barriers of what could be possible to fuel later technology development. So in this case, we introduced um, a, a, a 3D printer which could deposit water ice on the interior of 
a precision manufactured membrane, and then a sintered foundation, which would be fully exterior to the water ice shell, um, which could be from sintered regolith. Uh, very fortunately, we were able to be connected with a uh, with, with a researcher, with, which became our PI at NASA Langley, named Kevin Kempton, uh, through the Centennial Challenge Program, who was interested in the concept of Mars Ice House, but uh, was suggesting that instead of having it be 3D printed, that we introduce a habitat concept that could be filled and frozen um, by water ice. And so this uh, initiated a on and off two year collaboration with NASA Langley, where uh, we introduced a, a system where essentially water ice cells could be filled and frozen and where we could introduce a flexible, adaptable program on the inside of this habitat concept for a crew of four. We spent some time working with them, um, thinking through what the material and bladder and uh, restraint layers of this uh, inflatable structure would actually be and uh, did some basic programming for uh, a crew of four, as I mentioned. And uh, thanks to additional funding that was received through, I believe, like SIF funding from, from Langley, we're able to do some initial experiments to validate that we can actually achieve the kind of mechanical strength that we would want from the ice shell and also achieve the kind of translucency that we're interested in. So uh, larger ice grain translates to better mechanical properties and also better translucency, which was exactly what we had in mind for the ice house and ice home concepts. Um, there was also some additional materials, uh, material research that was done at Langley by Sheila Theobald's team. Uh, and none of these were too exotic or, 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 or specific. It was basically just freezing and thawing ice in Tedlar bags with various types of fittings. But it was, uh, it, it spawned and it was sufficient for us to be uh, received and accepted to the materials and space science experiment, MISI, which I think is really exciting. Um, and it kind of shows how the architectural concept led to additional research uh, aboard space station. Uh, we had speculated at the time that a greenhouse could be introduced into the Mars ice home concept. And this spun off into the NASA Big Ideas Challenge which myself and Christina Chardula were um, organizers and judges for in collaboration with NASA Langley. And there were some really, really wonderful and interesting uh, concepts that were introduced as a result of this challenge for Mars greenhouses. Uh, now I'm going to jump ahead to phase three of the 3D printed habitat challenge, where we introduced two concepts for ISRU derived Martian habitats. The first was version one, which is on the left. And the second is version two on the right. The first version introduced two inflatable uh, membranes that were brought from Earth with a regular shield printed uh, around them for radiation shielding. The direct feedback that we got from the competition was that they were interested in the 3D printed shell being the actual pressure membrane. And because it was a competition, we very dutifully obliged and changed directions. But we were fortunate to win the final level of design for this round of the comp competition anyway. And what we introduced was a sulfur based regolith uh, printed shell with an inner lining of high density polyethylene. Um, so here you can see uh, a lander where the uh, robotic systems and printing systems of the habitat would deploy as well as the exterior of the habitat itself. We were working with Apis Core on uh, some of the construction levels of the competition and together came up with a concept for how their current uh, printer and deposition technology could be applied uh, to a future Mars context. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we introduced uh, high density polyethylene on the interior of the habitat. Don't ask me how we would <laughs> regulate dust from getting everywhere in the course of this construction sequence that was largely out of scope for us. And we were working with the constraint that inflatables were not something that, uh, that the organizers wanted to see. But in any event, we had a pre-integrated mechanical core that deployed upwards and we introduced a general construction sequence for the habitat. Here's a view of the inside of one of the crew quarters of X house. It's a wardroom of X house and uh, construction sequence simulation, where you see we have a pre-integrated mechanical core, as well as high density polyethylene on the interior, windows that get in place over the course of the construction sequencing. Uh, the mechanical core allows for horizontal spokes to support 3D printing of floor plates, which we don't have demonstrated technology to do 
as of today, but hopefully in the future. And then finally, the regolith shell that's printed around the outside. Uh, we introduced within the material system of the habitat, uh, a horizontal and circumferential hoop reinforcement that could be uh, manufactured from basalt fiber on the surface of Mars. And um, so there, there you have it, the composite wall in the material system. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it for the 3D printed habitat challenge. Fortunately, as a result of um, our success in the Centennial Challenge uh, competitions, we were contacted by UTAS, United Technology Aerospace Systems, because they were interested in our process and in uh, incorporating a kind of design thinking methodology to some of the hardware development that they are doing or were doing for the next step program in developing Equus hardware. Um, so over the course of two years, roughly, uh, we came up with a pallet geometry, which enhanced the mechanical strength of the pallet that they were introducing for their hardware encasement. Um, and also did some initial testing relevant to that in regards to ergonomics and usability. So on the right, you see Dan Burbank, who's holding the handle on our bug prototype of this, of this Equus pallet and uh, came up with some visual design concepts such as what you see on the right. And I'm hoping that this will be the first of many uh, aerospace industry giants that will be reaching out to designers and to architects in particular to consult and to incorporate design thinking um, for how these systems can integrate better within, uh, with, within larger projects. Uh, as of last week, we are very, very happy and very fortunate to have kicked off a project in collaboration with Icon 3D, NASA, as well as other partners called uh, MPACT, Moon to Mars Planetary Autonomous Construction Technology. What MPACT is, uh, is essentially uh, an initiative to introduce 3D printing on the surface of the moon within the next decade. Icon uh, was a finalist, as we had been, in uh, the 3D printed habitat challenge, and they are the first US company to have a fully permitted 3D printed house. Um, and they're extremely successful in the realm of concrete 3D printing terrestrially today. So we're really excited to be collaborating with them. Um, this project was, spun, was spawned as a result of developing some key functional requirements in collaboration with NASA, which would serve in the near term the needs for 3D printing terrestrially on Earth, and in the long term for autonomous construction of habitats and other surface infrastructure on the Moon and Mars. Um, and we're really excited to be working with, with all of these guys. Uh, the phases of the impact hardware development timeline are such that there's basically going to be research on deposition techniques and technologies to get started first. And uh, the primary infrastructural elements that are going to be addressed are going to be foundations, landing pads, and rows. So any kind of horizontal construction followed by vertical construction, hopefully leading to habitats. Um, Search is not doing any of the hardware development, but again, the forcing function of having architects on board is really something that is propelling the vision of uh, fully ISRU printed, 3D printed structures on the surface of the moon in the future. Uh, so we are working with uh, Icon 3D and NASA to establish how design, how design concepts for lunar structures can inform technology development, can inform regolith technology milestones and, and what exactly needs to be accomplished in their roadmap to actually get to the point where we can 3D print ISRU structures. Uh, and I want to have, I, well, I actually did pretty good on time. I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, I want to have a special shout out to our collaborators, particularly these individuals in the bottom right who've been working with us on this project and uh, some of them are on the call today. Thank you so much. And it's really amazing work with, working with you. And uh, with that, I can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. Um, it's good to see all the action uh, 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 happening uh, in your front. Uh, uh, we're a little bit uh, behind time, uh, so we're going directly to uh, our uh, last speaker, uh, who will inform us about the realities of being human. Uh, Jack, uh, I, are you ready to go? I am ready. I'm trying to find out how I take over. Okay, start sharing. Share screen. I, I enjoyed uh, your Can talk. Can you see my screen? Not yet. 
Not yet. Okay, let's try something else. Um, all right. What do I, what? Can, can, can you help? Uh, what button do I press to uh, show you my screen? Okay, there must be a green and there's yeah, I've, green I've pressed sh share screen. Uh -huh. What does it come up? Uh, did you first open your file on your computer? Uh, uh, yes, I did. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jack, click the tr Jack, try clicking on the window that you want to show and then uh, click share and then click share screen. Okay. Um, In the future, Jack, you'll just be talking to the machine and saying, share my screen, it'll do it. Position. But for now. Uh, or do you want, want, want us to share from oh, our share. end? Okay. Oh, okay, great. Oh, now there you can go. see it. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Now you want to All click right. on... Uh, Full screen, Jack. Perfect. We you got have it. it. Yep. Great. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Madhu, for inviting me. Thank um, you for finding the time. <laughs> finding the time. <laughs> During a <laughs> pandemic, we have nothing but time, it seems. Okay, good. Uh, well, uh, the study uh, that I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, addresses several of NASA's uh, primary risks, but more important, the, the results of the study provide information that will be useful to anyone and everyone who is involved in uh, Mars mission planning. Because, I mean, you, got, you folks as architects, uh, I'm asking you, would you ever design a building without knowing the purpose of the building? Probably not, but that's what's been done up until this point, from the beginning of serious Mars mission planning. Here, no one has, here, here. no one has ever, no one has ever conducted a systematic or comprehensive analysis of the work that would be performed during uh, a um, planetary expedition uh, until now. But I've worked in the field of human factors, psychology slash engineering for 40 years, and we have a method. And the method is applied uh, to every project, whether you're designing a handheld unit for a handheld computer for use by one person or the control interface for a nuclear power plant. And it all begins with a task analysis. And so where do we go to uh, develop a list of tasks that might be performed by crew during an expedition to Mars. Well, we started with the very first uh, modern exposition on uh, uh, an expedition to Mars, and that was the technical appendix to a science fiction story that Werner von Braun wrote in 1947 uh, to counter boredom in the, in the New Mexico desert uh, where he was confined and isolated with other German scientists uh, working on the American uh, uh, military rocket program. The science fiction story was unremarkable, but the technical appendix was later published, uh, well, it was later given as a, uh, an address at the Hayden Planetarium and then was published uh, in Germany as Das Mars Project and in 1952 in English as the Mars Project. And it lays out a conjunction class expedition to Mars. Everything you need to know to do that. So we started chronologically with uh, Das Mars project. And then uh, I went uh, sequentially through the uh, history of Mars uh, mission planning, uh, including the series of Collier's articles that led directly to the formation of NASA and through uh, all of the 
all of the contractor studies of the late 60s and 70s through the dark period of the 1980s uh, and into uh, and including uh, the more modern uh, Mars plans culminating with DRA-5, the Design Reference Architecture 5, published in 2009, which is the state-of-the-art um, uh, Mars mission plan. All along the way, we gathered, oh, we also reviewed science fiction and uh, uh, automated, I mean, robotic mission um, uh, data in order to identify the kinds of tasks that would be performed. <clears throat> so uh, the assumptions for, uh, for our reference mission are consistent with DRA-5. It's a conjunction class expedition organized in 12 mission phases uh, that are listed for you, a, uh, including a six month cruise to Mars, a 500 day or so uh, surface operation involving communication lag times requiring uh, autonomous uh, operations, uh, a six month a cruise to Earth following the, uh, the Mars mission stay. Uh, and then five days out from Earth, the crew would enter a Orion type capsule, uh, undock from the interplanetary ship and make a ballistic uh, re-entry similar to a uh, Apollo trajectory called a skip trajectory uh, while the interplanetary ship continues on unoccupied indefinitely. That saves about 25% of the mass requirement it seems awfully wasteful, but um, it was invented by Max Faget, by the way. For, I mean, first proposed by Max Faget uh, back in the early 1960s. He was the architect who designed the Mercury capsule. And the, and the wisdom of his decision it has been made pain, painfully obvious to everyone. And that is you put your people on top of the stack rather than alongside of it. Okay, so the key, mar the key mission phases, the six month cruise to Mars during which the crew will be very busy conducting training, not refresher training. There will be some refresher training, but most of it will be primary, primary training, which is in response to a change in NASA's uh, training philosophy to remove the burden from crew and trainers uh, pre uh, concerning pre-mission training. It also gives the crew something meaningful to perform during that six month cruise. 73 days out from uh, the, the Mars, uh, trans-Mars insertion burn, the crew will also witness the transit of Earth across the face of the sun, something that's never been witnessed before, and they will uh, be prepared to record that and, um, and then continue on. Um, the Mars surface de descent, uh, where the, the vehicle will land where, near where other uh, equipment has been pre-positioned, including the power generation, habitat, um, and supplies, and a, at least one ascent vehicle, the rovers, and so forth. Um, then there will be 18 months, approximately, of Mars surface operations. Now, you can tell that this is an, a very old photo, not just because of the uh, old NASA logo, but because uh, the habitat is exposed. It will be necessary to excavate a crater, uh, a cavity, the diameter of the habitat, and at least uh, two meters deep, uh, into which the probably inflatable structure will be moved and then covered with at least two meters of Martian regolith to provide the shielding necessary to protect the crew during the 18 months of surface operations. Yes, there will be a greenhouse operation because they'll be there for a long time. Maybe not on the very first expedition, but certainly by the second. Uh, Mars surface operations. The purpose of going to Mars is to conduct science. And that is the overarching theme. Uh, biological science that is looking for extinct and or extant uh, evidence of life. Uh, also understanding planetary processes, but there will also be habitability tasks, construction tasks, and maintenance tasks. During the entire 18 months on the surface, the crew must remain vigilant for Martian weather. Um, uh, in addition to solar activity and particle events that could kill them uh, when if exposed, they must remain vigilant for uh, dust storms, similar to the dust storm 
that occurred during the preparation of this report in 2018 um, in the, and 2019, uh, a dust storm that engulfed the planet and killed one of the uh, remaining two uh, rovers. And then there's the Mars surface ascent. Now I thought that the most dangerous phase of the mission would be the, the return to Earth, that is the undocking from the interplanetary ship and uh, expecting that, that the Orion type vehicle is going to uh, perform perfectly after years in space. And Steve Hoffman, the principal design architect, uh, principal designer of uh, DRA-5 advised me, no, 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 that, that, that ship exit will spend most of its time in the rather benign environment of Mars orbit and to and from Mars. It's the uh, surface ascent vehicle, um, the Mars ascent vehicle uh, that is um, uh, the most exposed to, to uh, damage. Uh, it will have been built six, possibly eight years before it's needed. Uh, it will be sitting on the surface of Mars for uh, at least the 18 months that the crew uh, has been there, but also for since the previous launch or landing opportunity two years before. And then it's going to be refueled by amateurs who have only done it in simulation before. So the Mars surface descent will be the most dangerous phase of the mission, as it was for Mark Watney, and I hope it'll go better for the future explorers of Mars than it did for Mark Watney. And then there's that six month cruise home to look forward to. Now, uh, imagine if you would, uh, living in a motorhome with five other people for six months. You've trained with these people for years. You know all about them. You know about their family. You know every joke that they've ever told and you are painfully aware of their, manner, their annoying mannerisms. You can't go outside, you can't even look outside during the six months because there aren't any windows. And then when you get to your destination, you, you will move into a slightly larger habitat and you'll spend 18 months with those same five other people. You will get to go outside occasionally, but you have to wear a spacesuit. And then you have that six month trip home in the motor home to look forward to. Behaviorally, an expedition to Mars would be a lot like this. Now imagine, now imagine that your, that your motorhome is so old and decrepit that it's going to take a whole year to get to Mars. And then you'll spend about 300 days, almost a year on the surface of Mars. And then you have that one year trip home to look forward to in your old cramped and decrepit motorhome. That's what it would be like under the plan that the current administration is, is pushing. So do what you can to avoid um, that sort of a mission profile. So we gathered, we assembled a, a list of 1,125 separate tasks organized by the 12 mission phases. Each task statement is, is formatted in a systematic uh, fashion, beginning with an action verb, what is done, to what is done, how is it done, and usually why. And this eliminates syntax as a variable when analyzing uh, the tasks. Here's an example, walk on planetary surface while carrying hand tools and wearing surface EVA suit to conduct geological research. Some tasks have human performance implications. Here's another, dig loose regolith from around the surface rover wheel manually using shovel while wearing surface EVA suit to regain traction to proceed. Some tasks have design implications. And in this case, uh, the requirements for a flexible EV surface EVA suit, the kinds of gas pressurized suits that have been used uh, so far and that are planned for uh, Mars exploration will not work will not support this kind of task. A mechanical or hybrid, a mechanical pressure or hybrid task, a uh, hybrid pressure suit, similar to those developed, being developed by Pablo de Leon in, at the University of North Dakota, uh, will be required. Or something that Dava Newman might come up with eventually if uh, that will provide these smart materials to 
uh, keep the body from expand, <laughs> expanding uncontrollably. Uh, but gas pressurized suits are not going to work. Somebody needs to tell NASA about that. Um, and here's another example, use spacecraft waste management system for solid waste. And yes, uh, some tasks have procedural implications, and that is indeed Haywood Floyd uh, reading the procedures for using the zero gravity toilet uh, in 2001, A Space Odyssey, which by the way is the astronaut's favorite science fiction movie. So we set about to, uh, after compiling our task list and reviewing reviewing it uh, on multiple occasions and asking NASA people to review it, including senior scientific personnel and astronauts. Um, it was concluded that it's like, it looks like behind the scenes at the Martian, uh, which I thought was a real compliment. So we first used NASA's categories and it wasn't uh, ISS categories to try to get a handle on these tasks and it wasn't these tasks uh, and that wasn't very useful. So then we used uh, subject categories and we started to develop an appreciation for why Von Braun included 70 men on his initial uh, expedition plan, uh, pared it down eventually to 12. Um, and then we hit upon uh, occupational specialties or crew roles. And we got a, um, a very good idea. Uh, by the way, the different colors are the mission segments, the 12 phases. Uh, those segments represent a phase and um, started to get a handle on tasks, uh, which uh, then allowed us to develop a survey instrument. Uh, we, we combined tasks, uh, multiple tasks into uh, 158 summary task statements that uh, 60 subject matter experts then rated in terms of how frequently it's likely to be performed, how difficult it is to learn how to perform the task, and how important is the task to overall mission success. Our sample of uh, SMEs included astronauts, former astronauts, uh, mission planners, engineers, psychologists, flight surgeons, and at least two uh, space architects, uh, uh, which include uh, uh, my old friend, Mark Cohen, and um, Chris Kennedy. And so thank you again. This uh, figure represents the results of the, or presents a summary of the results of the task analysis. The color represents the mission phase. The size of the dot is the difficulty to learn. And then the position on the X and Y axes of the dot uh, illustrates uh, the relative importance and likely frequency. And if you just look at the dot on the very far left, that's the least frequent task. And that, that is uh, respond to dental emergencies during the cruise to Mars. Well, uh, that's exactly where we would expect it to be because all dental issues are gonna be addressed in the months before launch. So it's very unlikely that there will be a dental emergency en route to Mars. And so that's where we would expect it to be. Um, the most frequent task is way over here, and that's communicate with other crew members uh, during Mars surface operations. That's even more likely to be more frequent than eating and sleeping. The most important task represented by this dot on the upper left is respond to technical emergencies during the cruise to Mars. That is probably the most important task to mission success because if you don't address the issue on the way to Mars, you're not gonna get anything done. And then the least important task is to clean up the barf after launch. So the fact that those four summary task statements are just about where we would expect them to be gives us confidence that the relative positions of all the other tasks uh, in our uh, plot are accurate. And that allowed us, the analysis of the tasks allowed us to identify uh, eight primary crew specialties listed here, beginning with leader, a, bio a biologist because of the science, a geologist because of the science emphasis, a physician, a physician, by the way, who is experienced in emergency medicine, 
um, an electrician, not an electrical engineer, by the way, nor a mechanical engineer, but a mechanic. There won't be opportunities to design novel systems, but there will be many requirements to repair systems. And so you need someone who can fabricate a connector out of scrap parts or who can repair plumbing. So people who are familiar with a toolbox and know how to use the tools. Uh, and a computer specialist because everything will be computer driven. And how long have you gone without requiring a computer specialist, even with your home computers? And a pilot navigator. Now it's important to note here that all the, the old Mars mission plans involve pilots and navigators, but the three most recent NASA Mars mission plans did not include a pilot, nor did they include a control interface that would enable the crew member to take control if the, if the navigation and piloting systems were to fail. I've interviewed dozens of astronauts and I've concluded that it would be difficult to assemble a crew of astronauts who were willing to simply die in place if their, um, if their propulsion system or their navigation system were to fail. So we've included that and hope that NASA pays attention. There were also four ancillary uh, specialties that emerged. The uh, crew medical officer, a botanist to handle the, the greenhouse, an astrophysicist to uh, to lead the observations and route to Mars and also the many um, experiments that will be conducted on the surface of Mars and an equipment operator. It will be necessary to, to move things around on the planet, on the planet surface. And um, so there will be something like a, a tractor device and probably with a backhoe that will be used to uh, cover the habitat with the two meters of regolith. We believe that those four ancillary skills can be handled through uh, by training primary crew members. And we believe that the crew size can be reduced from eight to at least six uh, by careful selection and cross training. Okay, I'm gonna go very quickly now. You're not expected to read this, but uh, we have the 158 summary task statements ranked in order, descending order of difficulty to learn. Medical tasks, EVA tasks, piloting and technical tasks. In frequency, communications tasks, habitability tasks, uh, monitoring and planning tasks. In terms of overall importance, technical, piloting and medical tasks. We've combined, we combined those three metrics to create a, uh, a derived metric that we call criticality and that gives equal, equal weight to frequency, importance, and difficulty. And number one in the, on the criticality list is, and the, this is mathematically derived, not estimate, uh, is to perform science-related EVA functions and then the most frequent and then monitoring and then the most frequent communication and so forth. Our SAMP, um, that was the task analysis. And then to get a handle on the abilities needed, we constructed decks of cards with each one, with uh, each of the 52 Fleischmann abilities printed on a card with the definition uh, and to which we added six social skills derived from the analog research. And then we, asked uh, samples of each of the eight primary crew positions, subject matter experts, to rank order those cards from most important to six performance of their job to least per important. So we had 42 leaders. Everybody's an expert on leadership, it seems, because we've all had good and bad leaders. Um, a dozen biologists, uh, 15 geologists, including planetary geologists, uh, 11 flight surgeons and emergency physicians, 11 electricians and 10 pilots and so forth. And then the results of this, well, you're not gonna be tested on this, but uh, that, those are the eight categories, leader, pilot, 
physician, biologist, geologist, computer specialist, electrician, and mechanical engineer. And I just want you to see NASA is spending a lot of money on teamwork research. Where does teamwork fall uh, in terms of the uh, importance assigned by these eight specialties? Well, it's damn important for leaders and important for all eight of the crew specialties. So uh, NASA's investment in teamwork research um, is well-founded. Jack, uh, Jack, I purposely put you last because if I had put you up first, uh, none, of, none of the uh, others would have uh, been able to, able to even talk because this is so very vital and interesting uh, to, to see uh, how when you put a human into the system, uh, things go particularly, uh, correctly put, it goes all right because um, uh, uh, engineers work at a very, very uh, low level of uh, fidelity with respect to many of these tasks. Uh, and I'm glad that you worked with Mark and Chris, among others, uh, to resolve this. But we got to close up. Um, did you have any particular? Okay, I, I'm. I'm just. I'm going to go right through this very quickly. I only have a couple more. Uh, these are the abilities. I. Uh, okay. Problem solving. Anyway, the they're primarily cognitive abilities, uh, social abilities, and then lower ranked are the physical abilities, and. For each of the eight crew specialties, they're listed in order. We've actually assembled some uh, hypothetical crews. It's pretty easy to get a crew of six with backups. Uh, five it can be done at, uh, with trying to limit to four. Uh, you'll, if any person becomes uh, disabled or incapacitated during the mission, uh, uh, the mission is likely to fail. So research products. I've showed you what they are. And um, we also include a list of 647 uh, lunar gateway tasks by mission phase as an appendix. And what would we do on Mars? Uh, I'd wanna visit the Fromm crater. Uh, those of you familiar with my analog research uh, would understand that. Some would uh, like, would visit Louth crater. That's a 10, 10 mile in diameter uh, patch of ice. And some would want to visit uh, Korolev Crater, named for the chief designer of the Soviet program. Uh, that's 50, 50 miles of ice, and that would support the kinds of uh, winter sports that Friedrich Nansen uh, conducted uh, in the Arctic in 1893, 1896. And of course, there's that beautiful view of Earth from Mars. You can see it there. Pretty sure you can say, there it is. That will, that's to remind me that uh, it will take a very special kind of person uh, to sign up for and perform ad, um, acceptably during an expedition to Mars. It, uh, funded by uh, NASA's uh, Human Research Program, my uh, collaborators were Jureen Adolph, Vicki Byrne, and Maya Green and special thanks to Steve Hoffman. Now I'm done. Uh, thank you so much, um, Jack. Again, it becomes very clear that, that somehow, somewhere along the line, um, we miss the fact that it's people who are manning these missions. And uh, um, uh, it's so good to drive this into uh, the head. I think architects follow this a little better than the systems engineering group of people who would prefer that there be um, hardware and robots doing this, all this, and uh, we'd just be a sideshow. But anyway, yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions, but to, um, yeah, but to uh, um, instigate uh, a panel discussion, I would like to provoke and, uh, and prod a few things. So I would like to uh, uh, show a few slides um, with the hope that uh, uh, it will excite uh, uh, everybody with uh, some more <laughs> probing questions. Um, can you see the slides? Sharing. Uh, are you able to see the slides? Yes. Oh, Let's go. Okay. 
Now, um, a, a, a discussion is ongoing and it's fresh in the minds of people now. What are some of these dinosaur rocket ships being built today and being funded for, you wonder, when small agile companies are building uh, rocket ships that are doing new things? And uh, you start to wonder about the time lag associated with technologies and their insertion. Um, you know, I won't point fingers, but I, I think you know what I'm talking about. Now we have done reusable vehicles and we know how to fly them and we've been flying them. And um, I think the, that is the future. Fully reusable vehicles are uh, coming up very fast. And I'm happy that uh, we have some people right here, a few miles down the road doing it. Um, many of the ideas that we were proposed are in these books. I use, I use it as the textbook for our classes, both in the School of Engineering and Architecture. And uh, again, <laughs> I'm reminded, like Jack said, in 2001, dialogues and discussions have, an, have uh, happened between humans. They don't really happen between machine logic and humans. When push comes to shove, we always have to take the lead. And uh, it's one of my favorite areas. And uh, you know, I think Solaris is another movie that I have enjoyed, the classic Solaris, not the remake that happened recently, that delves into what happens when the human mind is stressed beyond uh, the capability of our species. Now, there is some discussion about civilian code of conduct versus military. We know that uh, we do these things um, uh, very, very well. And uh, hundreds of people get together and go into mis missions for m months at a time. Uh, so we know we do that. Now, there is this new thing we call NASA and the private space sector and NASA as customer. How many of you believe this is really true? And that brings up to our, uh, this particular document that is circulating. I know that some of you had comments on it. And what does it really, really say? It's really a, a, a wind up document for four years of this administration's uh, work, which I believe was kind of good compared to the earlier administration in some respects. So it's an administration agnostic document. It wants to reaffirm uh, US preeminence in human space flight. Uh, it talks really uh, uh, hidden in the text are what we call free world values, specifically American va values. <laughs> a lot, a lot, not a lot of people would agree. Um, and um, the projects that the free world values can, can project into space activities, what is needed. But once again, American lar largest is what makes human space flight happen today. E pluribus unum is my, my favorite thing. Now, competition of ideas. Um, at the, this is what Buzz told me the last time I talked with him. It's a great thing to have competition of ideas at the narrative and mission design level and global consensus when we get to the execution level. It's something to think about. <coughs> so NASA right now has go back to the moon in, uh, in, um, on, the, on, the, um, in the, on the plate, a gateway, Artemis, which means land two astronauts in the South Polar region, build a habitat, not sure, because what came out of HR 5666 may not agree with what NASA wants to do, and set up manufacture for fuel. I mean, it's so technocratic. The most important thing as architects and human factors people we can do is stress the importance of a narrative a current narrative that is more compelling for Americans and for the global population. Like a train ride, you know, people want to do some fun things, uh, get out there and experience the beauty of nature outside of planet Earth. Uh, go visit uh, places where people went 50, or 50 years ago and set up shop a little bit, do things like planetary defense from the moon, uh, consider something connected with the United Nations on the moon. Uh, Olympics, sports, um, um, you could have the archive facilities on the moon. 
um, perhaps lounges and space tourism that some of us talked about in this class. And these are the kind of things that the public would enjoy. And looking at um, inside of lava tube to see if we can build things there uh, that would support uh, humanity. And uh, finally, also the idea that humans are a meditative species. They want to know where we came from. And the way you experience that is in the rawest ways of nature and the spirituality and religion. So these are the kinds of things that humans want to do. And uh, uh, I think um, um, John Mankins talked about the Moon Village Association. And they have an idea. And it's a very simple idea to put a, a telescope on the moon looking towards Earth um, in very high fidelity that people can watch to see all the things happening, uh, including the forest fires that are affecting us in California right now, and then have a new refinement and a new sensitivity about what it, is, what it means to be human, part of a species rather than us versus them. This is kind of thing that came up in clash about what we would like our leadership to do in real time about thinking about the moon. So what is possible for our species? I think amazing possibilities uh, exist for us, but it's all about planet Earth, uh, at least for now. Um, in the uh, New Era document, they talk about Leo being the next important area for commercial activity. And we agree with that. In our reports, we mentioned this. And we think the space station still has a lot of things that we can do there. We can build many things there. We can use um, other vehicles. If, if our um, system don't come online at the right time, we can still fly uh, uh, fantastic missions uh, into off, uh, uh, beyond Earth orbit using upper stages that we commercially have. And there's a lot of things we can do between the Earth and the Moon. And uh, these are the things that we talk about in the class. And last of all, we need movement and transportation support on the lunar surface, which we will look at in this coming term. So uh, we want to now talk about what all that means with respect to the things we, we saw in these beautiful set of uh, um, presentations. Uh, I can't thank all of you enough. And with that, let us go on uh, with one more little remark, which says uh, <laughs> there was a, a baseball manager by the name Bussy Bavasi, and uh, uh, he put the screw on the, the spiritual golden rule that we all know. And <laughs> it goes like, uh, you know, the, the, the person who, the people who keep the gold make the rules. I think all of you know this one. And as of now, NASA holds the gold. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know if they are re they're releasing it slowly, but some good things are happening in the private industry. That is not Norman Cousins' um, studies. With that, um, I will go ahead and open up discussions. Uh, um, some questions uh, for the entire panel <laughs> uh, who are uh, thankfully with us for this very long session, but please go ahead. Um, I will open it up to all of you to ask each other one. Uh, if you have your hands up on screen rather than going up here, I do that. I will ask my teacher, Brand Griffin, to ask the first question, if you don't mind, Brand. <laughs> I, we can't hear you. You're still, you're still oh, mute. Okay, here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is to Jack. Um, uh, in fact, I've cited your work in the past, and I thought uh, what you presented was great and it's foundational. But I'm curious. Uh, you seem to think that a gas pressurized suit is not going to work on Mars. Why? Well, there are certain tasks such as. Uh, bending and kneeling tasks uh, that would not be supported by the current uh, designs. And it would, would, I believe, would require some form of uh, maybe hybrid or mechanical pressure to accomplish the kind of 
flexibility needed to perform those tasks? Yeah, that was the same question I had written down for um, Jack. And I think you're familiar with the, the US Army's exoskeletal missions, uh, besides what Pablo uh, de Leon is doing at UND. Um, they offer some promise, uh, Jack, in terms of um, moving your limbs and so on. And uh, it's, uh, it's an area uh, to consider, don't you think? I'm hopeful that the technology evolves, but it, it's maybe, still maybe you can educate me uh, uh, it, about gas pressurized suits. It's still a pressure well, suit. You still have to fight the pressure inside it. Yeah. Exoskeleton won't, you know, it in, uh, enforces your strength, but it's not what you have to fight inside the suit, right? Absolutely. You know, you have to, you have to, the only thing I was uh, suggesting is that uh, the bending moments would be helped by the exoskeletal system. And uh, of course, inside of your suit, uh, <laughs> there are many, many other problems. Uh, Olga, I think you're yeah. familiar. And, uh, well, typically the, the thing that comes up is thermal uh, because you have just enough atmosphere not to be able to supply water. And that's a technology we don't have. So um, in terms of the suit though, uh, astronauts don't do anything with their gloves. They put a tool in their hand. So tools can do a lot to get you to the surface or other things to take away that normal bending that we would normally rely on. But uh, it would be interesting to see. Um, certainly uh, EVA is the reason we go. There's no reason to go to a planet and not get out. <laughs> so it's fundamental, you know, it is the mission. And uh, the suits uh, are kind of the default design, uh, whether they're pressurized or counter pressure or something like that. But regardless, uh, every crew member is gonna need several. You can't just have one, they're gonna wear out. And uh, so it's probably an underestimated aspect of uh, the whole mission and uh, needs to be addressed too, for the same reasons that you do it. You did a great job in terms of analyzing, you know, what it takes to back that off, and you ought to design a suit around it. Is it uh, an exploration suit or is it a repair suit, or is it both? So, and thank and you for your gonna, presentation. That's we're right. I have to have a, a single person surface uh, spacecraft or rover or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, that could work. I think I've seen a couple of those, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, well, one of the things you watch an explorer do, Scott. Uh, is they touch and feel things. And you are in a spacesuit now, you don't have any haptic feedback at all. And the other thing you'll see a geologist do is take a sample, do this, and do this. You can't do that on an a, a, a extraterrestrial mission so easily. But I think some of these things robots can help us with. Uh, any other questions, guys? We don't want to dominate this talk. Um, I'd like to, to, to respond to the question of suit construction. Look, the Ames AX5 series of suits, there were five generations, addressed this problem from the beginning, starting in the 60s, ending in the late 90s, uh, or culminating in the late 90s. And, and the, the problem with, with soft inflatable suits is that they are not constant volume. All of the conventional convolute design suits, uh, the air moves around. So if you if your arm or your leg presses against one part of the suit, the air moves and it creates resistance and immobilization uh, on the other side. And uh, it's like these new, relatively new inflatable casts for broken limbs. Um, they actually immobilize you, and then. The problem is the design of the joints need need uh, the appropriate bearing design. I won't go into detail on that, but um, the uh, the AX series of suits were hard suits. The final one was was numerically machined al uh, aluminum forging, and it weighed something like twenty five pounds, and uh, it 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 beat the 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 ZPS Mark III suit on every criteria except glove flexibility in a head-to-head -head competition. 
Um, but you know, uh, the people who the people who pick suit designs want to keep the the you know the the latex uh, undergarment manufacturers in business, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and they're you know they're just married to the idea that a spacesuit has to be sewn, and <laughs> you know anybody who comes up with something better, it doesn't matter objectively if it's if it wins on every criteria, it's still not going to be contracted get a contract that's sustained. I know. And but so, 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 you know, we're in a situation where time and again, we can see the technical solution, people developed innovative technical solutions that work. Um, but, but NASA or, or the corporate world won't accept them because as I learned when I worked at Northrop Grumman, unless business development department had control of something from its very inception, there's no way they'll allow it to succeed. Yeah. So there's these cultural and managerial uh, biases against successful innovation, uh, and and it's a, a business logic too. Because if you if you have a, a philosophy that you're you're going to make your money by doing small incremental modifications, and or in some cases those are and in some cases those are improvements, and you're just going to incrementally improve 1% a year, you can stay in business for a very long time. If you achieve an order of magnitude improvement, um, forget about it. No, they're not going to go for it because it means that, that they're going to have to find a new line of business. And, and the critical thing that Mark left out about hard suit is the, is the most important one, which is you can operate at cabin pressure which means you don't have to go through that in, uh, unbelievable thing that you call pre-breathing protocol. I mean, how many times do you, would you want to walk out of the home at short notice and say, okay, now I'm getting ready to pre-breathe. It doesn't work that way in, uh, in the complex works that uh, Jack to mentioned that. Uh, right, right. Well, the, the, the AX5 was designed to operate at 8.5 PSI, uh, that is still a little more than half an atmosphere. Yeah. At least a, li which, a little which bit would better. <laughs> largely Mark, eliminate pre-breathing. Was, was the, uh, the AX5 25 pounds? Um, because uh, I, I've, uh, over the years, I've continually suggested hard suits uh, because of those reasons. And it seems like everybody thinks that it's like 300 pounds. No, the the Apollo EMUs were were three hundred pounds. No, the AX five was 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 much lighter. Okay, let's go to another question. Well, the Apollo suit was one eighty nine. The current suit is three hundred. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Oh, the, okay, maybe I have that backwards. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Barbara, we want you to ask the question that you were going to ask uh, uh, earlier uh, during the session. Olga, yes, yeah. Yeah, my question was actually uh, geared towards the skill set of architects or then uh, space architects and what, and I think was a question to Olga, um, what you think you are teaching to architect with architects in your master course, which go beyond and then, um, you know, what kind of width or breadth the skill set after the master studies is to also go into other fields other than space architecture? Yeah, well, Chris may add to uh, uh, what I say, uh, but it's we don't only have architects, right? And in the program, it's, we have students with different backgrounds engineers, human factors, scientists, and uh, architects. So, what's Important, uh, I think one thing is to learn the language, each other's language, you communicate and work together. And it's what is one of important, uh, 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 well, elements that uh, of, the, uh, of the program is because they work on team projects a lot in the beginning, especially. Uh, for architects specifically, of course, uh, to understand uh, the complexity of space systems and understand how one decision really uh, makes the whole tree of other decisions and uh, how one is influencing and affecting another. I'm talking about starting from 
mission and thinking about the whole mission. So how many would go, what they will need. But it's not just, you say, okay, it will be for 50 people, but you say like why and what they will be doing. So, and connecting all the dots, that's what's important. And for architects on earth, it's also important to understand uh, how systems work together of the building, right? Otherwise it will be a bad building and people won't be able to live there. Uh, for space architects, it's even more critical because then, as I said, you need to think about, okay, what is the mission, why it's, and like Chris is great about it. So he always has vision, mission, goals. So all students like, okay, so what's, what we're doing it and why? And uh, defining the tasks, said what Jack was talking about. Again, we design it for people still, right? So understanding all these complexities, not only physical, but also psychological complexities. But so that's what they, uh, they said. So this, we uh, try to introduce architects, especially to all those critical uh, engineering um, disciplines and uh, understanding it at least. We're not designing the rockets, right, obviously, but you need to understand that. You have to design that it will fit in the payload you have to understand how it will be deployed, how it will be maintained, how it will be, you know, will be taken off later on. And that's, that's a skill set. And uh, so I think you asked also where they go after the graduation, right? So um, as I said, well, it's still limited uh, for uh, international students, but for the US students, uh, they pretty much everyone is employed uh, in the industry. So we, luckily we have GSC just down the road and with everything that is related to it. And um, yeah, so that's uh, what they do. Um, yeah, my, my students, uh, uh, Barbara, uh, already come from a work environment. They come in to take courses and uh, they range from military installations, uh, uh, test pilots, um, flyers, uh, fighter pilots, uh, and all of that arena. And uh, they want to do my class uh, uh, to uh, to know more about human space flight. Well, that's actually, Marco, I, I add a little bit. Uh, so actually, it's how Master of Science in Space Architecture started. It started with uh, uh, the request from a group of engineers who came from Johnson Space Center aerospace engineers and like operational that. And they wanted to learn more about space architecture. They wanted to study and uh, to be able to design this and see it as a whole, the whole, you know, this uh, space design for space habitats, designing it. Uh, but in order to do that, to justify it for their employer, NASA, they had said like, we have to have a degree. So, okay, here is a degree for you guys. So it's actually demand came from engineers. Yes. Not from architects for the degree. Chris, well, I'm also asking because a lot of uh, people. I mean, we also had Barbara Belvisi and um, and Melody um, presenting, um, and and I was also connecting the dots to terrestrial architecture. So there's a lot of, I think, uh, in the space architecture community, also a lot of conversation going on. Uh, how can we use what we learn when we do? Okay think of space, you know, for terrestrial application. So I think that is also something I want, you know, I was interested in if, if some, you know. It's not the exclusive, it's actually more inclusive, actually, yeah. Okay. Chris, I have you a want question. to add something? I have a question. Uh, well, if somebody, oh. uh, Chris wants to, add, okay. But I also have a question for Barbara Bilvisi about uh, their project. Okay, after Chris. Chris has to go away here. Yeah. Okay, so um, yes, I think that uh, what we teach the students is to come away with a better sense of understanding your project, understanding what's the purpose of your project, and then understanding how are the humans and robotic systems operating. So understand the concept of operations so you can derive and understand the functions and the capabilities and the requirements of the system you're designing and then to be the problem solver to figure out how to achieve or or uh, meet those requirements in the concept of operations so there's a the skill sets is, is varied and includes uh, aspects of leadership communication integration um, design problem solving 
many of these kinds of skills. And, and so the students come away with, um, you know, a basic understanding of how to do the design design process, whether they're working at NASA or an aerospace company. And, you know, as, I, as we try to teach them, there's no necessarily right, right way or wrong way. It's really to understand the process and be able to apply that design methodology process within their new work environment and be able to be successful in that environment using those tools, hopefully that they come away with that we teach them. Great. Uh, I also to add, so because it, yeah, problem solving, but identifying the problem is actually a very important skill. And it's, it's uh, why, when you able to identify where it's actually the problem is, it's already almost half uh, of the project. It's already, you're on the road to success. Yeah. Okay, Marco, can I ask a question? Because I have to go soon. No, that's what Barbara has to go. <laughs> Please go for it. Oh, so uh, with the designs, uh, I, the question is again, so where's how you define the uh, required volumes for this? Like you said, for five people for Paris, but they're quite large and air actually it's all costs a lot. And not only that, but also did you calculate the power required and what is the source of power? Uh, it's a huge amount of power you will need for to support this truck. Well, anyway, so there are others, but. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so in terms of size, uh, we're still resizing a little bit. Um, uh, one module for five people, it was around 1000 square meter. But it was at the time when we had five domes, uh, so we shortened to four, and right now we're more around 750. Uh, but we're still uh, finalizing the crop selection. So everything goes back to the crop selection because it defined the size of the greenhouse and the aeroponic system. So then, how we split basically the crops between the two systems defined the size of the two of the two domes. So that's changed a little bit, but just to give you an order of magnitude, basically, it's around 750 square meter for one module, uh, one module with uh, four four domes, uh, which include the habitat sections. Um, we 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 probably gonna reduce the size a little bit, uh, but uh, but uh, but we need a, uh, we did the preliminary design review, we did the PDR, we're gonna do a, probably a delta PDR and moving to critical design review in two months. So in two months, I would be able to give you like much more precise uh, uh, information when it comes to the size because we're still resizing the systems. That was the first question. Uh, then when it comes to the air, we've been running a lot of CFD preliminary CFD. Um, and, uh, and we know of the, all the volumes, so it, everything fits in our system. Um, again, it might change a little bit because we're moving into deep diving into CFD with a much more specific anal analysis of the airflow and, uh, and, uh, and to see because of the heights of the dome. So it might change a little bit in terms of the volume, but the dome basically there some domes, the two domes for the waste, they're around six, seven meter high. Um, and for the greenhouse, it was a little bit higher, uh, but we might reduce a little bit the size again. Same, I need two, three months of deep dive analysis. It's too soon for me to tell you the exact figure, but it's just to give you an order of magnitude. magnitude. Uh, and in terms of power, um, so, we're not the, doing the power ourselves. So basically the plan is to team up with a third party, with a partner uh, to do it. It most probably gonna be powered by solar power. Uh, if it's not sufficient, then we will plug in uh, into, a, uh, into an electrical system at the beginning. Uh, we're looking to be as efficient as possible. Um, I cannot tell you right now how much power exactly we're gonna use because it's part of our, of our supplier selection right now for all the system that we are selecting, all the hardware system we're selecting is to analyze also how much power they're consuming over time. No, 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 no. So same, I need, a, for this one, I need four months to give you like a, a, a good order of magnitude because there is still a lot of analysis to run. You will need nuclear, solar will help, and electricity <laughs> from the source. So you have to have a power. No, 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 it's not consuming that much. It's not, I mean, it's not consuming that much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please, please don't poo poo nuclear because uh, uh, it is a steady option for everybody uh, here on planet Earth, too. We've got hooked to solar power um, for long on station, and maybe we've been hypnotized. <laughs> but the fact remains if you move away from uh, the solar yeah. 
um, envelope that we are in, particularly for Mars people, uh, you want to be thinking nuclear. Uh, yes. Scott, did you have some questions, thoughts to tell us uh, anything that's happening with respect to uh, the new documents that have come out after SPD one through four and the new era document and how it's affecting your designs? Um, not necessarily along those lines, but uh, during the presentations, we were starting to talk about class three uh, structures. And uh, when we talk about ISRU resources, the easiest, the low hanging fruit are the ones that uh, you can do with a very small amount of equipment, such as uh, collecting uh, the CO2 atmosphere on Mars and uh, extracting, you know, pulling, pulling out the oxygen, et cetera. Um, the other half of that, of course, in our field is uh, using it for building materials and the low hanging fruit is the ability to just pick up any regolith that happens to be on the surface and not worry about what it's made of and just use that as, as bulk uh, construction of uh, compressive structures. Um, the, uh, the other end of the spectrum of, is of course, if we are able to get um, smelters and different things like that, then we can start to separate that regolith into uh, minerals that we um, can characterize in pure uh, alloys and metals for the manufacturer end of things. On the, uh, the, the lower end of the spectrum with the regolith, we, we've, we've got to understand and we've got to um, keep in mind that all these structures are gonna be very low fidelity. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're probably talking about inches as far as uh, the uh, tolerance goes. Um, but uh, I, I guess probably Melody would probably have some experience on, on what they did on um, tolerance, but we'll start to be able to get more and more uh, accurate structures as we start to work with different types of additives and things like that. So I guess uh, I, I kind of wanted, Melody, you, you talked a little bit about that, but uh, how about, what's, what's your uh, perspective on the accurate, you know, accuracy and, and uh, tolerances of structures as opposed to, um, you know, using, actually extracting things from the regolith that will give us um, more pure alloys and things like that. I think we have a ways to go before we can actually think realistically about introducing regolith based structures that can actually be pressurized. I think that there's, there's just a lot of work that it needs to happen before we can get to that point. Definitely this impulse to strive for 100% ISRU regolith derived structure is the right one, just in terms of what we wanna achieve with a deposition technology, whether it be a concrete deposition or sintering or furnace-based melt based melting or, or anything like that. But realistically speaking, I think that binders and additives are gonna be a big part of what's going to actually enable us to build at scale. And, um, depending on who you speak to, people are going to give it different answers for you know what percentage of that material mix is actually needs to be or should be brought from Earth and what, and what isn't. So I think um, as, fortunately, like as, as designers, we don't have to go through all of that kind of expense and technology development to actually put forward a vision of what could be. And I think that uh, seeing a spectrum of, of, of visions or a spectrum of uh, solutions towards 100% ISU derived regolith structures and also not, you know, earth brought habitats, uh, class one, class two habitats that can also work with regolith shielding is something that we're really, that me and, and I think our team is really invested in. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done before we can actually say confidently what's what will happen or should happen. Yeah, I think one of the, the easiest things that we'll be able to do is just simply 
uh, excavation and uh, shovel around regolith, pile it up, do things like that. That that's going to be a really easy thing to do uh, in the in the short run. Um, probably some of the uh, first structures that we'll do will be paving and uh, landing pads and things like that uh, before we actually get to uh, walls and, and whatever. Yeah, low, yeah, I agree. Low gravity will be your friend, uh, uh, particularly on the moon. Um, uh, but, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I know that Baroque had a great deal of difficulty uh, with the nozzles uh, working on uh, uh, working on uh, sulfur concrete, and now uh, his company is studying uh, introducing even larger aggregates into uh, the cement mix, and uh, he's going through that. Uh, it's not it's not an easy thing to do. Okay, uh, you know I, I wanted to ask John Spencer uh, uh, one more question because John is John is the one who says uh, no bucks, no buck Rogers. And uh, uh, he uh, has been adamant in following uh, the money uh, to do these wonderful things. Uh, so, uh, uh, John, did you have any comments uh, on space tourism and how, um, how it's coming along? Um, uh, you know, I, I believe uh, that is the uh, lowest hang hanging fruit for a self-sustainable uh, space uh, industry. Uh, John, please. Yeah, so far, space tourism is the most profitable space business. Uh, when the Russians were paid to fly tourists to the space station, about 98% of the money was pure profit. Other than a space suit, some caviar, a little bit of training, uh, pretty much so it was pure profit. The Russians are space cowboys. But what I want to share with everybody just quickly is that uh, people in the financial world, are the, the best ones are really, really smart. And therefore, they're very curious. And they're very interested in lots of things. There's lots of capital out there looking for great teams and great ideas and ideas that have scalability and sustainability. And here's an important factor I've learned over the years. Really wealthy people compete with each other for cool things. In other words, when they say I'm working with a space design project or a space uh, Mars world, for example, their friends go, ooh, that's interesting. When I talk about orbital super yachts, everybody goes, that's interesting. Tickety the people that own ocean going super yachts. So we as a community are the core of ideas. We're idea people. And there are more and more people interested in our ideas and the space arena and see it as an expanding industry and business. And when you have all these billionaires, such as Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, putting billions of dollars into ventures and becoming more successful. The other rich guys say, wow, they're smart, self-made. They gotta have something going on. So I think the future is very bright. And I think uh, what Madhu and Ken has put together here is wonderful for the group to come together. First time I met a number of you. And uh, it's a very bright future. And what's we, one of the reasons we're doing the space conference, space tourism conference is, because it's time for a space tourism conference. There's so much going on. Yeah. At the heart of it is all about humanity and the future and ideas and linking people together to manifest these great ideas. So I'm very optimistic and excited about the future for very real reasons The money's out there and we can collaborate with people whose job it is to get you the money, investment bankers, and to help you manage it. So there's a whole teaming and ecosystem of Investors looking for good projects, and we are people who create great ideas and sexy ideas. Those are ideas that people will pay attention to. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. You know, John, John uh, as you know, uh, the Dragon spacecraft uh, can accommodate seven, and I've seen designs that accommodate up to 10. And NASA is in line for three seats. And now you know, finally, they've pushed the IHS people into saying yes we can have tours because <laughs> if you remember from your time of Dennis Tito and how hard it was to convince people to visit the station um, at NASA, but uh, things have changed. Things have changed a lot. And yeah, one, uh, one quick thing to do, 
Tom Cruise's production company is moving forward with the idea of flying Tom Cruise to the space station right. and do some filming for Mission Impossible 1950, whatever it is. Mm. Uh, and that really will garner international attention. You got one of the famous people in the world risking his life to do a movie on the space station. Yep. Wow. Yep. We can yep. really promote that like crazy. I remember ba Barbara Belvisi uh, will have some comments on, on this exchange, I'm sure. <laughs> Please. Aprabhu, uh, madam. Well, the, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with, when, uh, with what uh, John, uh, uh, John said, and it was very, very uh, uh, well said. Um, yes, yes. Uh, but, uh, I, I think the key to... I don't know, the key to attract investors, I've been an investor for 10 years before jumping in. So my, my background is in you know, business school, I studied business school and then uh, I, I learned in the books a bit about biology, a bit about engineering, a bit about ast um, uh, astrophysics. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a scientist by training. I'm, I surrounded myself with an amazing team and, and, I, and I got a lot of support from uh, Madhu and I originally started uh, in LA two years ago and a lot of folks at NASA. And, uh, but one thing that I can tell you from the investor side is um, uh, it's a uh, so being very creative, uh, but it's, it's all about the vision and the mission and what we are bringing to this planet and to the future of humanity, whether it's on Earth and on other planets. So it's all about the inspiration and, and investors love to invest in, you know, crazy idea, beautiful project, of course, with a great business model and, and, and you need to work through the financial and, and to build a, a proper proposal. Um, but I think it's also about the, authentic, the authenticity, how genuine you are about what you're doing, because those projects require a very, a lot of dedication. It's really, really hard. It's really hard. It's very long term. So I think it's what we need is, a, you know, all the space community to gather together and, and to show how, you know, genuine the motivation is here, how authentic we are in what we're doing. And I think this is how we're going to attract even more money and, uh, and proving that we're not letting go. That's a, that's a very important characteristic in, that you can find in many leaders. It's like, you know, you never let go. You adapt to the circumstances, but you stick to your goal and you just, okay, let's do it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's late here. I'm a bit tired, so. I, think, I think Olga has to leave now. Uh, uh, did you want to say something or... or? Uh, have, wish you. Wish Barbara you, has to. Leave. She has to catch the train. I only have yeah. to catch. <laughs> well, <laughs> a flight, but it later. <laughs> but uh, no. Thank you very much. It was uh, very informative, and like I am impressed that the most of the folks, you know, were here, and still many are still here. Uh, for now, uh, she had a very interesting question. So please let her ask a question to all okay. of you. And, uh, she graduated from the program some time ago. And, um, That's right. You, you enjoy, hello? You enjoy and uh, careful with the hurricanes. Get, yeah, yeah. Get yes, it. I have to make it there. OK, yeah. And, I got to uh, go as well. I see, we'll see you. you okay, it's Barbara. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. OK, uh, and Anastasia, did you want to say something? Um, do you have a question? <laughs> Um, hello. Yeah. Can you can you guys hear me? My name is Fanam, and uh, I, I was just mentioned by by Olga just before she left. Uh, actually, no, no Anastasia as well. Uh, oh. We just talked yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so, question that I had for pretty much everybody was like, I'd like to find a way to link space architecture, industrial design, which is the design of uh, physical products, uh, wearables, etc. Uh, systems engineering and tech to build meaningful solutions for the future of space. Because right now I feel like a lot of things are um, separated in silos and um, and there needs to be a lot more overlap, not only in the, in the education, but specifically in the application of these, uh, of these uh, uh, disciplines. So I'd like to know where one could start creating that link. Hmm. Thank you. I can make a quick note. Um, one of the plans we're working on with Space Tourism Society is, and we'll announce formally, so you guys are hearing it really early, that we're going to be forming the Space Experience Academy uh, here in Los Angeles. 
And the goal is to do just what this uh, was, was said, is to bring a lot of these different creative sources together in an academy setting to train people over cross disciplines to be better designers and thinkers for creative work and particularly focus on space and future. I mean, how do you cook a fine meal? What's space music? What is space architecture? What is all these things and mix them together? And uh, if you think of a model, movie studios used to have lots of different departments that were all brought together to work on a movie. And, it, it, and that gave them control over the quality of the end product. So that's why we're gonna create the Space Experience Academy, a space academy, not engineering, but creative. That's gonna be the center of the whole thing. Yeah, you know, I think, I think um, there are very many venues, but uh, it's most important that you engage um, in organizations like um, uh, this one that you're on in now, um, there is the uh, National Space Society. Then, uh, as John Mankins mentioned, there is the uh, Moon Village Association. Um, and um, all of those uh, inform us about what, what we can do um, to, to broaden our, our horizons in all matters, um, starting from policy, uh, all the way to detailed production of products. Uh, you know, uh, John, I don't know if you were on that, uh, um, on that National Space Society program two weeks ago, I think, when they talked about a day in space and we had investors there and uh, uh, we had uh, uh, Angel, uh, what's his name, um, Jervetson, had a great talk on how he's building up. That's right, that's right. And, no, I missed that one. Yeah, you know, anyhow, uh, the reason I, uh, I thought about it is because of this question that, uh, Phnom, did I say, say your name right? Yes, it's Phnom. No. So um, uh, she said, uh, what are the products? Um, uh, you know, uh, the NSS president sat um, for an interview and he had a, a mug uh, next to him. Uh, it was shaped like a rocket. <laughs> and I'm sure half the people uh, in that discussion were looking at the design of that mug and not paying much attention to Jeff, you know? And I was going, oh, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> Madhu, Madhu, can I answer her question, please? Yes, yes. Okay, so Hanam, uh, to answer your question, uh, the Space Architecture Technical Committee of the AIAA has been developing a collaboration with the World Design Organization, which is the oh. flagship organization for industrial designers. Uh, they are proposing a set of five uh, so-called design challenges uh, to address issues around the ISS National Lab okay. facility. Uh, and um, if, you, uh, if you contact Olga or me, we can tell you about it and we can uh, recommend you to to be on one of the ch design challenge teams. We haven't announced this officially to the SATC yet because uh, the pieces are still in motion and we they haven't settled the exact dates. But it looks like yeah. the design challenges will be held in October. For it'll be like a two week sort of charrette, a virtual charrette. There you go. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Um, You're yeah, uh, I'll contact you and Olga. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so did we ask questions of everybody? I think it's time to wind up. I think, uh, uh, wait a minute, I, uh, who else do I see on there? Uh, is, that, is that Katie, uh, the famous Krishna Thangavelu? Would you like to say hello? Oh, uh, we have Elif here. Elif, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, do you hear me, sir? I do. Uh, uh, please uh, tell us, what did you think of this gathering and uh, what did you get out of it, Elif? Elif is an, uh, a yeah. space architect from Turkey, am I right? <laughs> I'm not a space architect yet, but I'm planning to be, actually. I'm just, uh, I finished my bachelor in architecture and I will start for a master's degree in, at International Space University. Okay. I hope to do that. Uh, my, um, first of all, I want to thank for this great uh, gathering. And my question is about uh, art, actually. 
when we design some uh, building and monument on earth, we consider about uh, making it artistic, beautiful. And when we come up to space architecture, designing in the other space, do we have to think about artistic beauty as well? Or it should be only function, functional and economical, or we also should think about art making it artistic. If there is like, um, how, um, like, what did, you how think be, yeah. what did you think of my design for the orbital super yacht? For me, all of the uh, designs of other space very beautiful to me, <laughs> but I don't know it's uh, intentionally have done or it's according to the needs it is. Okay, uh, Alif, let me tell you what I discovered work while working at NASA and at Northrop Grumman. Um, art and beauty are very important, except you can't talk about it. Because <laughs> if you talk about art or beauty to engineers, right away they become very suspicious that you're, quote, gold plating the project. And uh, so the, as long as you don't make them exert any cognitive energy to understand what you're talking about, they'll let you do whatever you want. <laughs> just don't make them, force them to think about it. This, this, is, just a pri this is just a private intimation. Uh, don't broadcast it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, this is Phnom again. I'd love to interject here. Um, so I, I design a lot of products. I'm an industrial designer and space architects. And uh, I've spent the last 15 years convincing engineers to develop the things that I design. And I succeed every time. And the reason it works is because I found a, a common language with, um, with the engineers and, and really uh, find them in a place where where they can believe what I say and I trust their opinion. And then we solve problems together. And I think the world of space architecture and system engineering and aerospace engineering needs to find a common language as well. And, uh, and that is the only way we can find um, a place between you know, beauty and things that work and things that mean something to the future of our generations. So and congratulations. Uh, Anam, I think it's, it's important to have um, you know, a, 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 a joint uh, um, a kind of feeling towards production of, uh, of beautiful things. And, um, you know, one of the reasons uh, I uh, walk into the School of Architecture with my program is always to mention to them that, um, that space architecture is capable of bringing a new aesthetic uh, to our world in terms of performance of materials, uh, frugality. And these are things we have known for many years. I mean, uh, Buckminster Fuller talks about it, you know, and uh, that, is, that, is the tar that is the direction we are headed in. And uh, uh, so thank you for, for bringing that up and would love to visit your website and see all the beautiful products you made. Yeah, let me add something really short. I think that uh, good design, actually great design, something that you know, combines art, engineering, and science in one product. And uh, we sh uh, surely should consider art when we are designing for uh, space habitats. Um, because we, like, I, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, living in isolation, um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the inner space architecture. So we, when you're living in a small environment for a long time, we um, need to make sure that our state or you know well being uh, stays um, even and uh, you know piece of art not only a piece of art but you know uh, paying deep attention on the uh, color scheme that you use inside of your space habitat um, really actually can enrich your um, you know joy enrich your mood which actually will lead to a successful mission because if we are enjoying you know long-term duration uh, longer long-term staying um yeah for example we talked about uh, two years on mars at least it's going to be at least two years um you know mission to mars and uh, aesthetics is something that will come to play um and art is uh, uh, what defines you know good design because it's not you know, good design is, is not about just beautifying things in a pretty much thing that some engineers thinking that we're just making things pretty. And uh, this is not really true. Great design is actually making 
product better or environment much much better Absolutely. Yeah. mark who was it who said that that um, the truth is beauty beauty is truth and that's all there is a uh, John uh, Keats. That's right. That's right. You know, and uh, these things ring a bell in uh, our um, uh, human condition. And, uh, you know, some of these things that we build and fly, uh, they are beautiful. And, um, you know, uh, we want uh, people to engage in uh, more beautiful things. And uh, uh, space architecture can, can be a mover and shaker in that arena. Yeah, you know, I think SpaceX is doing a great job in some of their designs. I don't, I don't particularly like their precious suit, but you know, um, some of the things. <laughs> Jack, you can't can laugh, but uh, there are some beautiful things uh, that uh, you know we are trying and trying to evolve uh, into um, a new world. And space architecture is uh, is opening up the horizon uh, for for many people. Okay, now you know I'm looking at uh, at the um, at the audience, and there are several people here. I would love to have discussions like this in the coming uh, uh, in the coming um, in the next time. Uh, I see, uh, 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 for instance, I'm looking right here. I see Tom Rusak. Um, uh, Tom, did you want to add anything before we close up for a minute? Hi, Tom. <laughs> I, I click. Into Hello, the guys. Does it work? Are, are you in London? Where are you? Uh, currently, I am in Prague. Prague. Um, because uh, we have a new baby, so we moved uh, oh, back to Prague. Everything is more easy now for us. <laughs> okay, congratulations. We, we want you to come on the next uh, panel, which I hope we'll orchestrate Excellent. before Christmas. Yeah, perfect. Maybe, maybe I could speak also about uh, space greenhouses and. Uh, research in uh, closed loop ecosystems and uh, uh, related uh, space architecture topics. We would love for you to do that. Let me, let me go on to the next person. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks Sam. So. Uh, Sam, how are you doing? Uh, Sam, are you listening in? Sam Zimenez is also a space architect. We have known many years and <laughs> doing some fantastic things. Yeah, hi, how are you all doing? Great, great yeah. session. Really yeah, like yeah, it a good. lot. It was, uh, Great to see all you guys all come together in the one, uh, one roof, so to speak. Uh, good topics. Really like the ideas that, towards the end here about the, you know, some of the thoughts about the, uh, the regolith and the binders and that, you know, it's really not going to be there for some time yet. You know, we're seeing a lot of that talk being. We want you to come on the next panel uh, and, uh, and have a good discussion like the one we had today, uh, Sam. Sure, be glad to. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to bring out, though, you ought, you ought to really uh, think about the uh, other part of the space architecture, which is on the on the, uh, the ground side here, you know, space facilities, air space forts. That's right. That's exactly you know, that's right. Going on. Yep. Uh, yep. Things are happening, and not only in New Mexico, but lots of things are happening. Uh, you're in Mojave, so I'm sh sure there are more sprouting uh, around the world. Uh, John Rutledge, how are you doing, John? John is my a favorite TA in the School of Architecture. Maybe Melody met him <laughs> when you were there. John, what's going on? Hey, greetings. Greetings to all. Thank you for the invitation. Great to be here. Okay, I see Gabriela. Gabriela, did you want to say something? Let's go to Divya. Divya. Divya Chander uh, is a doctor. She sat in my class. She's an <laughs> anesthesiologist. And perhaps you, you were listening in, Divya? I was. I was listening in both rooms in my house. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good to hear from you. You know, we want... Do you know that after your class, um, I submitted that stuff on the, uh, that multi-generational interstellar spacecraft I designed with human factors issues. And then I ended up co-chairing a session with Mark um, at uh, the, which was it? The space engineering conference or I, I don't know something in 1996 anyway oh were, that was the uh, 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 American Society of Civil Engineers space construction conference I, I haven't seen you in ages but it's nice yeah, that was in nice Albuquerque seat. right yeah that was right <laughs> right yeah okay thank you for coming in and uh, listening in uh, you know do I see um, uh, did I see Tom Spilker uh, let me see here uh, Tom, are you with us? 
Uh, whoops. Hold on. Had to kill a phone there. Okay. Uh, 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 can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Tom and uh, his uh, I, friend John. I turned off the phone and now I can't hear you. <laughs> whoops. Okay. Well, keep talking. We'll listen to you. Sorry, I can see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. How perfect. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, 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 speak up. Uh, anyway, I've enjoyed uh, listening in on this. I've, I've learned some very important things and uh, heard some uh, interesting opinions, some of which conflict with other interesting opinions that I heard. But uh, this is always the uh, process when you're doing something new and trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. I'm really glad that people are thinking about the architectural side of things and not just the engineering side of things. And uh, I'm hoping to see the architectural and engineering side of things without a very rigid boundary between the two. I think both disciplines are helped by mutual understanding there. Uh, the architecture side, understanding the constraints that the engineers are working under and the engineers understanding the constraints and requirements that the uh, architects are working under. So I'm very happy to uh, see this happening and look forward to more. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tom. We really appreciate the work you're doing with the uh, uh, Gateway Foundation. I was very happy to see your design. And now there is a Adil here. Is that, is that Adil Jeffrey? Uh, who I know. Probably not. Uh, I see uh, Ravi and Adarsh are here. Uh, Adarsh, did you want to comment? Not who I apologize, but I've got to run. I'm running okay. late. Yeah. Thank you. I so wanted to say, yeah, I wanted to say thank you to you and to Ken. This was a really fun event. It was great <laughs> to see everybody. Okay, question there, off, but thank you very much, uh, Melody. We wish you the best. Uh, your presentations are beautiful. And I think you must talk with uh, Phnom uh, about, uh, about doing, making those, um, those beautiful, uh, I call them sculptures, uh, because uh, they have marketable value. I mean, it may be a long time before we see them built to scale, but yeah. <laughs> the beautiful things. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, Madhu, I had just one question. I yes, organized Robert. a conference on space arts about in 2013. Ravi and I both did it at NASA Ames. And then I, one question that came up was the role of color in the scheme of things when you are a long distance travel of 18 round trip, say, around the Mars, I'm thinking of. And so does it, anybody looked at the role of painting, how to paint the color? Oh, sure, I'm sure. Jack, did you have something to say? My, my. I always have something to say. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I, um, yeah, I paint, artwork, it would be wonderful on a long duration expedition. Um, common areas should be reserved for mutually agreed upon art, however, um, but in private quarters, uh, people can have what they, what they would like. Um, I, I would like to say one thing. In about 1983 or 1984, I attended a meeting at Ames Research Center that I believe Mark Cohen um, I know he was there. He probably was one of the organizers. And you had an architect by the name of Khalil something or other. Nader Khalili. No, Nader no, Michael, Michael Khalil. Michael oh, Khalil. Okay. Michael yeah. Khalil, yeah. And the presentation was so artsy. And I thought, oh, this is so trivial. This can't, you know. But the, for the past 36 years, I have thought about that. And his, the design that he had for a spacecraft control interface was brilliant. Not metaphorically brilliant. Uh, it was subdued colors, indirect lighting, 
the control interface was a, a, a bar of polished material illuminated from within. Um, and it really, in the more, I, the more I've seen real spacecraft, the more I've come to appreciate what a spacecraft could really be. And um, I just think that uh, over the years, my appreciation for what architects bring to the design environment is, is wonderful. And it's what sets, sets us apart from chimpanzees. I mean, chimpanzees use tools. Architects help engineers build and design tools. An architect gives it the, takes the edges off and makes it a beautiful thing to behold. And shall I, we call it? So, uh, shall um, we call it the human touch, Jack? Yeah, it's um, more I, than that. And, it's more than that. It takes more. That kind of skill is not equally, is it's not uniformly distributed among humans. Uh, it's an exceptional. Thing that that architects bring to the design task. Um, this is this is phenomenal. I'd like to to bring something to the conversation of color. Uh, color is one of those things that humans feel. So feeling is something that a lot of engineers and architects kind of put at the end of their list of things to do. And and I believe that in order to be successful in space architecture, you have to put feelings at the forefront. And feelings specifically for colors is the, the conscious, is the unconscious. And when we think about architecture, traditionally, we think of static color. But color is something that actually changes, you know, with whether the sun is or your mood or anything like that. But using the technologies we have access to today, like AR, um, you know, MR of different kind, you can actually change the room based on, you know, what lens you're wearing next to your eye. So, so that flexibility of color, of feeling inside of an architecture is something we should tap into. Yes, you are absolutely right. And architects, uh, I don't know about the rest of us, but I sat in classes that had to deal with color and uh, uh, I was introduced to the work of Joseph Albers and Mark, I think you know these names, Johannes Eiten. Uh, these are the people who did some early work uh, uh, in yeah, Yo Johannes Itten was the first director of the Bauhaus. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so color is very important. Uh, uh, thank you for asking. You know, we, we have to wind up. We are half hour, um, uh, you know, behind schedule here. Um, so I would like to thank um, all of you who came on board to make this an interesting event. And uh, we want to have more of these discussions that uh, then can provide feedback, not only to the public, but to the acting professionals in the field. Um, I want to thank you all. And uh, uh, I want to let uh, um, our uh, event organizer take the mic to close up the event now, unless you have something very, very special or specific to mention. Or is it all bye-bye now? <laughs> oh, bye-bye. Okay. Uh, Ken, nice seeing you all.